Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the Deerfield uh, Select Board Board of Health meeting for August 19th, 2020. Oh, we're starting a little bit late due to technical difficulties, um, common occurrence, which is 5.10 uh, uh, p.m. Um, let's see, so I'll, I'll just, we're meeting in the main meeting room at municipal offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. Meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required particip uh, public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law um, Chapter 30A, Section 20, uh, broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television, FCAP, uh, remote meeting connections uh, noted below. Sounds like we have Carolyn. Um, so you can join the meeting uh, on our link. If you go to our homepage, you can look at our agenda and click on the link for Zoom. I'm not gonna read all those letters and numbers. Or you can call in, um, you can dial in 1-312-626-6799. And then our meeting ID is 952-2899-6363. And then you'll be prompted for the passcode, which is 127247. Um, you can also, uh, you know, there's a bunch of telephone numbers depending on where you are. You can get a, you, you can use a 1-800 number. There's all different ways to, to sign in, or you can just sign in, you know, using your laptop or, you know, mobile device using the, Zo the Zoom app. So um, meeting attendees should mute their phones. You can star six for landlines unless asking a question or commenting. Um, that, that mute your phone and also unmute your phone if you want to ask a question. All attendees should wait uh, to speak until other participants are finished. There's usually a lot of lag with these meetings, so just wait till people are done and then just state who you are and speak clearly. And um, so our agenda today, I call this meeting to order. I'm gonna chair the meeting tonight. Uh, uh, Dave is here and Carolyn's on the line and Casey's remote and we have other people remote. So um, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we have no hearings or appearances today. Um, we're really here, we just wanted to meet, this wasn't a typical night for our meeting, but we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, our, our reopening plans and some COVID updates and different policies, personnel policies as they relate to COVID-19. And I know Casey will fill us in on a, on a bit of that. Um, are there any select board, you know, announcements or board of health announcements right off the bat? Or do you want to just get into the, the items or go ahead, go ahead, Dave. I think, um Oh, thank you. Passed, yes. Um, who has been a great asset to the town. Uh, and you know, even if he disagreed with people, he always listened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's public servants like that that help this town grow the way it has grown. So, uh, reaching out to his family, I know there's no uh, services scheduled for him, but um, we wish the family the best and, and our sincere condolences on his passing. Yeah, thank you. I know that um, there was a, a mention in the obituary that if people wanted to donate in honor of him to the, um, Frank, the, the hospice, local hospice, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, Bruce was an amazing talent. Um, he had many, many years in public service, working for the FERCOG and um, managing large projects. And um, he just had a way with understanding how larger projects would happen. And uh, he served many years on our, on our finance committee and, and was on our uh, building advisory committee, chairing that with, or co-chairing that with Julie Chalfont. Um, it was a shock to, to see that in the paper and we're, we're all very sorry. And, Again, we offer our condolences to his family and we really appreciate every bit of uh, service he gave to the town on uh, many different aspects that we worked on. So, um, let's see. A couple other things just to hit on real quick is, you know, I, I've been watching- Excuse me, Trevor, I just, just want to add that oh, um, we're going to really miss his expertise. Yes. He, he was helping us on the building committee so much. Yep. And, um, it was really really important he, he did he had a way to understand large projects to make them a little simpler and you know he really knew how to deal with you know with all the different aspects of engineering and 
you know, how, how, to, how to manage a big project like that. He had had so much experience and we're, we're definitely at a loss without him, for sure. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to hit on real quick, the, uh, we have a, we've um, installed the large Dropbox out front in the lobby. Um, a lot of people are, are asking about ballots. So for a special election is coming up on the um, September 1st uh, for the primary, for in-state primary for, you know, House and Senate. Um, and so, you know, originally we had the smaller uh, drop box attached to the police department wall when you first came in to the right. Um, and that could handle ballots, but we, we assume that we'll be getting a lot more ballots. So um, it's taken us a little while because we keep getting them in damage, but we finally have in our large, um, installed our large drop box, which could handle all of, uh, probably all of the ballots at once. It's pretty large. So. Um, and that's right when you come in the door and there's signage there. And so anybody that wants to, that has asked for a mail-in ballot, has filled it out, um, wants to come and drop it off. Uh, we know that Saturday and uh, Sunday will start the in-person early voting for that primary. And uh, there'll be some times the following week and the following weekend, but um, you can always drop it off, you know, just fill it out. You can mail it in if you want to mail it in, but if you're concerned about how long it would take in the mail and you want to be sure that it gets to us, you're more than welcome to drive down and walk in the front lobby there and, and you'll see the giant box. You can just drop it right in there. It has a ballot sign on it and um, so ready to go there. That's all set uh, for you. So, um, so I get really the main, the main issue today was to talk a little bit about our reopening plans as they relate to COVID. We have, I have a select board meeting. We're, I think we're all gonna stay here for, or most of us are gonna stay here for at seven o'clock tonight. Uh, is it school committee meeting, sorry, at um, seven o'clock. And um, you know, that plan, the reopening plan evolves on that as we negotiate with the staff and um, try to think about holidays and who, who's coming back and what do we have for testing and making sure we have all the security in place. And um, so, so that, that's been an evolving rolling target. And um, we think that's probably gonna um, roll out a little slower than we were thinking in the beginning, but it's all for the safety of our, of our staff and, and our children. So it's understandable. And Darius is doing a great job with his staff. They're all doing an amazing job trying to get, you know, get that plan up and running for remote and for hybrid. Um, so, We'll have some more information about that and some finance stuff on, on the school, uh, Deerfield Elementary. I think Frontier was last night, Waitlease was the night before, and there were some other, other nights uh, were the other towns. Um, so really this kind of ties in a little bit with that and ties in with our open, opening for, um, for early voting, you know, uh, the elections. We, by law, we need to be open to allow people to come in and have free access to their polls. And so uh, we've, developed Barb has developed a plan and working with Casey and the department heads and how we're going to do that and how we're going to handle um, you know keeping the town safe the building safe and the traffic flow and um, so I, I think maybe I would turn it over to Casey to maybe just fill us in a bit on where you're at with that and um, I know you've given us a plan to look over and do you want to do you want to hit on the highlights of that Casey Sure. Okay. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen, oh, nice. which is kind of messy because I downloaded a lot of stuff today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I hope. Ah, it's not letting me do it. For some reason, it won't let me do it. Oh, maybe. There it is. Can you see it? Yep. Yep. There it is. All right, so what we did, and I had worked with Dick on this for quite a bit, and basically there were a couple of elements that we needed to cover. And because COVID has, is continuing to evolve and it's, we have to deal with employment issues, um, folks at home have issues that they need us to be aware of, so that are employees. And we wanna make the public aware of how we're handling things right now. So we created this plan and I have to say one of my colleagues, um, a very nice person from Lexington shared his plan and I used his as a baseline and um, made, made some changes, you know, added some stuff, refined the appendices, which include policies and, and will include other plans for other departments and programs. But 
really created, um, I think, a working document. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start at the top. The purpose is to, we recognize that employees coming back to the workplace in this situation face unusual circumstances, and so do visitors. So we have to be careful to protect the public health and safety. Um, I reference the reopening phases in Massachusetts. And right now we're in phase three, step one, I think, Carolyn. Um, and then I tell everybody to check through the state's coronavirus website. And at the end of the main section of the plan, there's references to links that people can use to find that information. Karen, or Carolyn, can you mute yourself? Oh, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody else. Somebody needs to mute themselves. <laughs> Star six. Okay. All right. So we go through definitions first, and that's yep. hand washing, symptom, symptom check. You are muted. You can mute or um, unmute yourself by pressing star six. I had to six. mute them. I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm unmuted. I mean, I was muted. Yes, you're now. muted. I'm unmuted now. Yep. Right? Okay. Yep. So basically we go through a series of definitions. What does it mean to do this? Be vigilant for symptoms. What is social distancing? What is hand washing? Um, face covering, use of gloves, and there are exceptions to face covering. So we, we note that very briefly. Um, and this is basically for the municipal offices and regular programming that we've pushed out or connected with people um, in the office, the main office, the police department, South County EMS, recreation department, libraries, senior center, they all have different protocols and different requirements. So I'm going to ask them to do separate plans so that they can identify those specific things that they need to do to make sure that they're complying with all of the nuances that come from their spaces or programming. Right. Because for instance, the rec department needs to intersect with the programming requirements that DPH has for athletics. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is sort of the bent. But we go through the protocol, so workplace safety protocols is the next section after definition. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat a regurgitation of the stuff that we've learned through the public eye about how we're supposed to be taking care of ourselves in the workplace and out. Um, it does, we go over social distancing guidelines, um, facility considerations about particularly where we're having items delivered because we're all ordering from Amazon because <laughs> um, we need face masks. Um, and then we do go through a section where it says wellness and self-certification of symptoms. And that's for employees and visitors because we have an expectation to protect the employees, but also if we moving into a certain type of reopening phase, um, that expectation changes when we add visitors to the mix. So then we move into references. You'll start to see references as you get to page nine mm -hmm. for a self-certification form. So where employees actually certify that they're, that they're healthy and they haven't had a contact. Um, and that's Appendix A. Um, we have exposure guidance in Appendix C. We have leave and travel guidance in Appendix D. And so there, those are specific items that outline how we will handle employee questions and or employee requests or situations. And those are the key pieces of guidance that we need to push out to employees now because there have been a couple instances where we've had contact and we need to refine how we're handling everyone's understanding of this. So this, this third area after leave and travel guidance, you'll see it says phase reopening and I'm hoping everybody can see my screen that is sitting in the audience. Um, basically we're working through our ability to, to Connect with to connect with visitors as employees and still maintain health and public safety for everyone. Um, so I've identified, as I said before, residents are encouraged to use to utilize the town's website for online resources to conduct business. 
almost all of our business has been pushed out to the website. You can buy your transfer station sticker. You can register your dog. You can do, you can send us comments and questions. Um, you can find updated information about how we're gonna handle certain activities and programming. So we, we recommend that everybody use that platform or give us a call and ask us if you have a question. We are working, we're just not open to the public because we're trying to limit that contact. But as I said a little bit earlier, there are sections like emergency services, elections, public work, recreation, South County Senior Center, Tilton Library, all those facilities and programming have specific guidelines. And so the department has no best how they need to handle their spaces. So what, I, what I'm going to ask, and I, a couple of months ago, I sent them an email and said, hey, think about this. Um, but I didn't really have a good refined idea of how we were gonna do this. So in this section, the page that I'm looking at is page 10. It basically says that these specific areas need to address the specific guidance and concerns that go with their programming or service. And so they will provide, I will ask them to provide their plan in an appendix that we will attach. Um, particularly library and senior center because they do have specific protocols and concerns. You have the elderly population rotates through those two facilities for programming. And so there's, there have been concerns throughout my CEO call about how to handle that. And I looked on the governor's website and there's some guidance that's just been posted for libraries. So I think we can expect to hear from Candace once, she once I tell her that I have a draft that I want everybody to address. Um, and, so, and, then, and so then I break down phases and I break them down as A, B, C, D, E. Phase A, and we're really in phase A at this point, it's just not formalized. Most staff are returned to work either in staggered spaces or at staggered hours. And that's really dependent on the workflow and what the situation is in the office because we still have to maintain the occupancy rates that the governor has identified as required. Um, we then have phase B, which are town facilities reopened for appointments only. And at this point, actively with certain programming like, or certain requirements like licensing and permits, we have started following this type of a guidance idea. So if someone needs to pick something up and they need to actually speak to somebody, we meet them at a specific time. I know the town clerk's been doing this for specific things like swearing someone in or marriage intentions because the state requirements maintain that you have to have a physical interaction. You have to see somebody signing something or taking an oath. So it, it really falls down to our phase right now is between B and, and it's between A and B, but for specific things that we have statutory requirements, we had to make adjustments so that we could meet people safely so that we could take in paperwork or facilitate them getting through paperwork that's official. And then phase C is, I'm sorry, phase, C, phase B is open for appointments only. And um, this piece, we still have to maintain all our safety protocols. Curbside services should still be utilized. So if we're leaving documents for someone to come pick up or sign that we don't have to have a contact, that's what, that's what we can do. Phase C is when we would open with reduced hours and limited capacity. And I have some information to flesh into that that I found very late today. Um, and then phase D would be when we open with regular hours, but under specific safety protocols. And phase E is open to the public with no restrictions. And so following the governor's guidelines, we're nowhere near being in the last two phases of this, even phase three. Um, and then the next section is additional information. And so I've created links for people to use once this is published to get to other information, general information, gathering information, travel information that's been published through, the, through DPH or through the governor's office, citing specific information. The next section 
is appendices. And so we have the employee self-certification form. We have instructional videos. So one of the things about reopening, one of those requirements is making sure that people have access to training so they know they're properly handling things. And there, one of my colleagues mentioned, hey, there's videos out there. And it is an allowable practice to ask people to watch the videos and just confirm that they watched them and then monitor to make sure everything is being cleaned and disinfected properly. And this will become very apparent when we open for early voting, which happens later this week. Um, appendix C, and so this is, these are, Appendix C is a key piece of information that I need the board to address because this is the one that includes guidelines for leave due to exposure, illness, or childcare. And the scope of that, the purpose is to mitigate the issues we're all running into. Um, the scope of it is it applies to all town employees that don't have a conflict or a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and it outlines contact with employees and reporting to work. So we outline how we're gonna handle somebody calling in and saying, hey, I had an exposure or hey, I've tested positive. How do we handle that? Um, so we refine that and say, an employee is instructed to contact me, the town administrator, who will consult with the board of health agent or other health personnel and determine how to handle a contact issue where someone thinks they've been exposed. Um, and then we have to decide how we're gonna deal with that, how testing and that sort of thing. And that follows the MDPH protocol. Then, we have to create the leave arrangement. So if someone's tested positive, but can work remotely, then we can put that into place if we have the ability to do that, which we, at this point, are building our, our um, resources to do that. So we're investing in um, technology so that we can create that. Um, if there's an issue where you have an employee who has to stay home for childcare, this appendix, Appendix C, de defines that. Um, then we have work from home requests. If somebody doesn't feel safe in the workplace, how are we going to handle that? Um, so if that per if a person requires or requests a remote work uh, accommodation, then we can say, okay, these are the reasons we would give an accommodation an employee test positive, an employee comes in close contact with somebody who's infected, an employee um, comes in contact with someone who may have had a, a distant contact, so a third party contact, um, an employee who's required to stay at home because of school or a school, school or daycare issues, um, or an employee who's required to provide care for a family member. So this section, gives you a reason for the request, and then it tells you how we're gonna handle it. And so in this case, an approval or disapproval would be, employees are not guaranteed requests for remote work, as certain positions cannot be performed remotely. Um, so we will, the town administrator can work, can refer to the job duties, work with the supervisor and determine how to make an accommodation. Um, also, employees may not be granted permission to remote work, work to remote work, if if there's an if there's something that needed needs to be done and that's safe to that for that person to be in um and then requirements for working remotely we define what that looks like so you have to maintain contact with your supervisor or the town administrator you have to complete your assignment you have to meet all your deadlines and notify us if there's an issue and then if that person's unable to perform the work, then we have to go back and figure out how we make adjustments. And then we also mentioned flexible work hours, which we had mentioned in a, in a previous policy, because flexing time at home to deal with, with other issues can be a useful way to make sure that tasks are still getting completed. And so what we say here is an employee can start work early reduce a lunch schedule or work late. But we also say that flex time shall not result in overtime, that employee schedules shall not be adjusted to begin earlier than seven or later than six. And we could change that time. It's actually highlighted in case we wanted to change that time. 
Um, but we also create a request to do that flexible work option so that we can track and keep records in case the auditors have a question or in case there are other questions that come up. Um, we mentioned the fact that we need to be able to make reasonable accommodations. And this is similar to how we would make reasonable accommodations for an ADA request. Um, so to the, the extent that employees require an accommodation, they can file a request and we'll review it. Um, we'll try to, that needs to be an interactive process. So how can we adjust what you're doing so that you can work remotely? Are there training modules that you can take so that you can be working remotely and maintaining what your qualifications would be or what necessary, necessary training you may not have performed um, the last week or so, but if we can fit it into that schedule and, and give an allowance or an accommodation, that makes it easier for everybody to get the work done because some of these trainings you have to complete. I know there's a lot of highway trainings that are required over a period of time that the training modules themselves have switched to a remote uh, access platform. Like today I had a training module for procurement and they've moved everything to a remote platform, but it's a, still an all day thing. So those types of accommodations we outline. Uh, we also refine some of the understanding around the family's first coronavirus response act leave because there's still questions about that. Um, and we address the telecommute, traveling and telecommuting measures, any return to work issues that may need to be addressed after somebody comes back from a flex work schedule or for another reason. And then we actually hit hygiene rules when you're at home because it's important to remember that we need to practice those at home as well as at work. So a Appendix D is also the out of state travel policy. And this is the next one that we needed to address because we're in vacation season and people are traveling. Hang on, Casey. And so Casey. refining this makes it easier for employees to can understand what the that? expectation is. And it also allows us a guidance document that we can quickly refer to and say, okay, here's what you need to do. If you can have you hear us? Let's work that out as an employer, manager, supervisor, and the employee. Can you so hear us at all? In this, in this section, we have <laughs> the purpose, the scope. Um, we actually mentioned the same thing that the governor did. There's lower risk states to go to that may um, uh, that may make it easier for someone to travel just to get away for a few days because goodness knows we need a break. Um, and then we reiterate the stay at home requirements for employees who return from a lower state or exceptions for stay at home requirements. If there's necessary, you know, if you've got somebody who comes back from a low risk state, then we might not have an issue. Um, we address if somebody has been to a high risk state, how we're going to handle that. And since it happened to me once, I think it makes it easier if everybody can just refer to this. And then the rest of these appendices, so appendix E is the vacation request form. Um, and I think I'm missing one appendix, which is was referenced a little bit earlier, but you see the gist of it as I'm scrolling through is that it's really to provide guidance to the employees and to provide guidance to the supervisors as to how we're gonna handle these things. Because this continues to be something that we're in a, in a pattern of, of hold on, we're not sure what's gonna go on, especially if we're worried about any uptick that might happen in the fall. So having these policies in place that we can measurably change if necessary, but that gives us leeway for interpretation, but a guidance document really it is a good place for us all to be. Is that, does that make sense? We can't tell you. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear us? She can't, she put us on mute. You can't hear us. We can't hear us because you put us on mute. I, I the just want to like oh. you to your microphone. There we go. Well, you can press star um, six. And I also want to remind people oh, that um, the whole you time that the town hall Can you has been closed, yet? our expectations have been that people um, take extra precaution and that they protect each other in the work situation and at home. So we've been asking our employees all along to do extra behavior 
and have extra limitations on them. And this is our opportunity to formalize that because um, we actually just don't have a choice. We have, we're you know, moving along now and we need to have it formalized. I know you had a Trevor, a question, oh, Trevor, sorry. No, that's okay. We were on mute, so uh, Dave actually had a question. The, uh, just for point of interest on the Family First, uh, with that 80 hours, that's for a calendar year. That's not for each instance, right? It's for a calendar year, yes. Okay. I think we have to spell that out because some people are going to interpret okay. it per instance. So that's a good thing for me to make an adjustment on. I will... Um, I don't have the Word document in front of me, but I can make that adjustment. Okay. They know it's already been tried. Uh, in, yes, in, and in, that's... That's in the private industry, but not in the town, so... Okay. Um, yes, it is in a calendar year, and the reason I know that is because I had a question about it myself. Okay. So... But yeah, I, as we were going through, like I said, I had a pretty busy day. Um, so, <clears throat> I have one so if I clarify that it, it's in a calendar year, does that satisfy the question? Yes. That yes. I could make change? Yeah, for me. Okay. So, and the vacation thing, uh, when people go away on vacation, say they want to head down to Florida for two weeks, um, when they come back, they can't come into, they may not be able to do their job Say they drive a plow truck, it's in the middle of summer, I mean, middle of winter. Um, they can't really work from remote, so um, it, it would make sense not to go away to Florida. We're not going to deny somebody that, but when you come back, you can't come back to work for 14 days, so that's really a month off. And um, they aren't, obviously aren't getting paid for those two weeks. Or they use, and so this is the thing, they can choose to use their own time if they have it Correct. to do that quarantine. Yep. And one thing, and so that's what we were trying to do is identify, identify solutions so people, we don't have to answer the question 15 times. Right. But yes, when you go away and come back, um, in order to get back into the workplace right now, if I understand it correctly, we have to have, a, you have to have a COVID-19 negative test. Yep. And then you can come back because that's the state travel advisory. I would say we would need to follow that anyway. Agreed. We've identified. Yeah. And then if you do come back from a hot spot, you need to understand that if you cannot work remotely, and there are a few things you can do sure. to assist with the work remote for certain disciplines or certain departments, there's training things that can be done. But you also have to accept the fact that if you make that choice, that you may have to use more of your time than you wanted to. Right. I just want to make sure it's clear that employees, if they decide to take off and go to a hot spot or somewhere that's not in the state's requirement, that um, you know they don't get to go on vacation for two weeks and then come home and sit home and get paid for two weeks. That's not how it works. So I just want to make sure that that's yeah, completely so clear. <clears throat> In Appendix D, we say that in the re-entry into the workplace section, before re-entering the workplace after the 14-day stay-at-home period, such employees may be required to submit a COVID-19 test, have his, her temperature read, and or answer questions designed to determine whether he or she is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So employees returning to the Commonwealth in the, the section above that in this Appendix D, Yep. Um, that's what it I'm says reading. we have to produce a test, a negative test, and that's the same. Like I said, that's the same requirement that the governor has. Right. Exactly. Um, that's perfect. I mean, if they can come back and produce a test that they're negative, that's fine. Um, it's just you need a little bit of time from that travel and the negative test, right? right. Am I right about that? Yeah. Like a day or two or Three something. Three to five days. Yeah. So you come or back. Or you? I think the guy. So Carolyn, can I ask Maybe a question? Carolyn could I think the answer guy that. says. You have to produce a negative COVID test within 72 hours yes. of entering the state. Um, Casey, what's really important here is the incubation period is on the average five days. So we, we do not want to test before five to seven days. So if a person is coming from Florida, they're going to have to be, uh, and they took an airplane, then 
they are going to have to wait to get a negative COVID test five to seven days from the time that they flew back into Massachusetts. Right. Because otherwise those tests are not worth it. You're not getting an accurate so um, opportunity. It seems like an Appendix D under Section 5, we would need to kind of add a bulletin, and maybe it's here somewhere, where um, we would need a test taken um, no sooner than five days, and then right. um, and then it and, it and then we'd have to ha get that test within 72 hours of taking that test. So, um, just so we know. What it appears to be the standard is five to seven days. So, for yep. us, no sooner than five to seven days right. is what the window yep. so maybe if we, um, add that. we want to put in. So, no sooner than five to seven days upon return to the state. Yes. Upon the last potential exposure. So if you were flying in, you want to count from the time you landed five to seven days out. If you drove your car and you drove straight and you only got gas, I, I suppose, you know, you could do it from a little bit earlier. Left. But, I mean, I wouldn't want to know what the circumstances are, I guess, in that case. Yeah. To make sure that they have a legitimate test. Yeah. I mean, there's still potential to get, I mean, that's how it's spread in the Berkshires is people, you know, stopping and getting gas coming up from New York City. And, Little tip, wear you know, a glove every else. time you get gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe we could just add that. Um, but I think this is really good. Maybe I add that reference in, in Section 5, the yes. exceptions to stay at home. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So in reality, Hawaii really isn't an exempt state because it's very difficult to get from there to here without being in an airplane. True. Right, and you usually have, and you usually are not going to get a direct flight. So even if it was you were coming from Hawaii, you stopped off somewhere in a hot spot. Yeah. So uh, that doesn't count. I mean, you can't do that. Right. The thing okay. we all have to remember is we can't we can't um, countermand the governor's orders. No, I agree, but I think that's what. He, that's why yeah. we refer to them. I'm not. Honestly speaking, can we figure out a way to handle that? Yes, but you know, I think most people are thinking very carefully about whether they go on vacation and where they go. I right. know I was. Yeah, I just need people to. Right. Yeah. I mean, right now, if you go up into Vermont, nobody seems to have a problem. But if you're you know, going to Rhode Island, there's obviously different situations. Even though you're just going over the border in both cases. Mm -hmm. Maine, I think Maine and New Hampshire require a COVID test right now. At yeah, least Maine, does. Maine does. Yeah, I know that's that. How we're, that's how um, we are got reported, you know, people that weren't sick um, got reported back to us because the test was required. So I'm... They were asymptomatic. I'm really happy with the work you've done on this. It uh, um, it seems pretty thorough and um, and you know, I had a lot of help. help. Yeah, well, that's that's what <laughs> it's all about. There is one section that needs a change to it, and it's um, I I need to make the change that we just talked about. Yep. Reference the fact that the Family First Coronavirus Act can only be used once. Um, and then, and then under I just noticed that under appendix under appendix C, um, I'm not sure which it's under flexible just after flexible hours at the top of the pay it says flex time, uh, no way removes working hours from the town. Um, it only allows the town administrator the right to shift hours at it says his but put just put his or her, um, just a typo kind of thing. Oh, I That's see. That's all. Just just. Include his or her. Yep. Okay. I think that's it. Um, I mean, Casey's really done a, a, a huge lift on. Yeah. This. No, it's great. This is very complete. I feel very satisfied with it. Yeah. So very I, professionally I, I, done. Thank Jim Malloy. Jim yes. Malloy thank helped. you, Jim. And so did Kate. And so did Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> this wasn't something done in a vacuum. And well, so did good. Dick. I have to say, Dick has read this three times. I kept handing it to him and he kept rolling his eyes at me because, you know, he, I tried to pull this together and 
give him sections to look at, and then I give him the whole thing, and so he's, but he's, he said the same thing. He thought it was pretty comprehensive. Okay, good. Um, but if you, if you don't believe me, call him and ask him. So um, if we... There is one section that I wanted to make an adjustment to, so I wonder, is the board ready to talk about actually approving this, or do you want to wait? I, I'm, I'm okay to move forward. I just, um, what, I guess what I want to know is who makes the decision on what phase we're in, and then, um, you know, okay. what the so layout. Okay, so that I think is the Board of Health decision okay. about what phase you're in. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to the, to the middle of the document where yep. it says um, phase reopening, it's item C in phase reopening. Yep, I see. Let me tell you how we're working. So phase B of our phase reopening is really what we're doing right now. And there is a, there's some information in phase B that I would like to add. Okay. Um, and this is the problem with working at home is I couldn't see all my documents. Yep. <laughs> but essentially what we're doing is we will reopen to the public by appointment only. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the library and the senior center because they have unique things. Yeah. Um, building is a little tougher. Our construction permitting requirements that the state has promulgated since day one means that there has to be an intersect either over the phone, on, you know, FaceTime or Skype, or outside with proper social distancing um, to handle construction issues mm -hmm. or septic issues. So effectively, we're in phase B. Right. We're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I would say um, the board would need to address it. So there was a change I wanted to make in this. So I would say the board would need to understand, okay, this is what we're physically doing. Um, and phase B, similar to how the governor does it, if the board were to accept the reopening plan and ask the chair to approve the phase B section change that I want to make after I send it out to everybody, um, then the board would pick that phase and just formalize it. So mm -hmm. by formalizing the entire plan and identifying that right now we're in phase B by appointment only. Right. This is what we're going to, this is how we're going to do things. Mm -hmm. You're going to call the offices. You're going to set up an appointment. If there's documentation that we can't push out to you online or yeah. via email, then we will leave it in the foyer and you can pick it up at a specific time. Right. If there's, for instance, when we get a drop off for FedEx or something, that goes to a specific place. So we tell people, leave your documents in the foyer or put it in the drop box. Right. Because as you noted, the drop box, we have the big drop box now. Yep. Um, and we had been taking applications like that. There are certain documents that you can't take electronically. And so right. we yep. sort of made that accommodation without formalizing it. So I would ask the board to approve this contingent to a phase B uh, modification just to show a couple more details that I realized I didn't have in this version and definitely address the travel policies and the guidelines for employment mm -hmm. for benefits use and such in right. the appendices and would the board consider having the chair do the approval of the final language for that phase B description after I send it out to all three members yes yep I'm good with that I'm okay with it Okay, so now that I made that all convoluted, would you guys be willing to vote it? Or yes. Yeah, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? I'm ready. I've read it. I think it, so, it's thorough. It's good, and we're you know we're slowly moving forward, and we're addressing people's needs as they need it by appointment. Um, the town hall, just to clarify, the town hall will be open during election hours only for voting early, only. Though. That's just, you know, the doors are open, but it's to come in and vote in person um, as required by law. But we're not open to come in and, and sit down and have a conversation unless you've called and made an appointment after this policy takes effect. You make an appointment and we'll have a space out open. People can be socially distanced. You know, there's cleaning, as you know, there's cleaning involved with all that stuff after people leave. Um, it's still a lot of work. Um, but as long as we, it is. you know, it's we're and, and I, I have to be clear, Trevor, too. We need to have a log book. Whoever comes yes. into the town hall has got to sign in. Yeah. So we have the ability to trace. Absolutely. You got to be able to trace. That's what I'm missing, Carolyn. I, I have it drafted. I just, 
was working in two different doctors. Okay. Yeah, I think it's we have to have the ability to trace. Yep. So anybody that comes into the town hall has got to log in time. Yep. And and your contact information and when they log out. Yep. That's perfect. And so for early voting, that's a little bit different because we actually have that information. I talked to Barbara right. about this mm -hmm. um, yesterday. Okay. So when people are voting, they're they're telling us, okay, this is where I live. Yeah. Here, take my ballot. Right. So we know who that person is. But we need the phone numbers, Casey. Contact. We need phone numbers. Okay, because I actually, Pat has drafted a list for me to do that. Okay. Yeah, you need the contact information, whether they, you need their cell phone, you need their home phone, and their email. We have to have all that information if you come into the town hall. I think when That's I. That's required for contact tracing. When I went to dinner the other night, we did that. You know, uh, we went to a restaurant and they took yeah. our contact information, which was great. You know, in case they have an issue, they can reach out to us. So. Right. That's, and so that's I new, had that in my head. But yeah, I was that's a new reality. I have to do that. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's a new reality. If you're coming in, that's what you got to do. Yep. And, and, and Barbara should be taking that information, even, or anybody, when everybody has an appointment. Yep. If you have an appointment with someone, they need to have that log book filled out. Okay. So when they every, come in the building, we need to right. do Every department head should have a logbook in their office for their appointment. And in Barbara's case, for the voting, you come in to vote, you've got to have all that information filled out before she gives you the ballot. All right, so for contact tracing, that's what I would add in the reopening for appointments only. I would add contact tracing yeah. um, and right. identify what that looks like. It's going to be your name, address, phone number. Um, email if you have and it. and the time you came in mm -hmm. the time that you right. came in yeah any anybody okay. that comes in has got to we've got to be able to contact them okay all right so i could make that adjustment send send out that change i would have kate look at it because yes. um i think we need to make sure that we're preserving employment rights mm -hmm. but also employee rights right um, but I would make the change in phase B to include the contact tracing mm -hmm. and um, make that, re refine that, that top paragraph a little bit. But if the board's okay with it, this can be a start that I can send out to the department heads and say, okay, this is how the municipal office is, is going to do it. Now, I already have received a couple of pieces of information from the rec director, and I'm pretty sure that the library director has some information she's waiting to submit. So we'll start to see an influx. But I think the emergency services, they have a different protocol. Mm -hmm. And right now, the services, we are still pushing services out to everybody. We made accommodations for the transfer station very early on, but contact for you know, other highway activities or other DPW activities could remain limited because I think that's what needs to happen so that we don't create a contact situation for the guys out there who are in construction season and need to be working. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so I'll make those motion? refinements. So, so I'll make a motion to approve the um, reopening um, plan and documents provided um, and, 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 and I make a motion to allow the chair to sign after um, the uh, amendments we talked about Casey's going to put in um, and then have it reviewed by us uh, the chair will sign when she's comfortable I'll second that uh, I will second that or, or yep. Dave, let Dave second it okay any any further discussion all those in favor Dave Wolfram aye Trevor McDaniel aye Carolyn Ness aye Thank you. Thank you so much for all your help on that. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me, Pat. You know. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, it's good. Talk. Casey, um, it was a huge amount of work, and I just want to thank you. You've been yeah. were wonderful, and you addressed all my concerns the mm -hmm. entire time. I, I want you to know it was a real effort. And so one thing I will say to the board is if something else comes up where we need to add an appendices that I think the select board slash board of health needs to vote, I will bring it to you. Right. Um, 
So let's see. So now that that's done, there were some uh, administrators, town administration list you had here, uh, some hemp stuff and yes. let's see. So we received three notifications from the Cannabis Control Commission that three growers, hemp growers have been approved. Now okay. hemp regulations are completely different from marijuana regulations. That is an agricultural use. Correct. So the guidelines for that are different. And I have to say, I'm not up on those guidelines right now. I hadn't really been paying it. It wasn't in the front of my head. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, I'd have to research it. Nope, these but are the three. These are permits that come through this, the Cannabis Control Commission. Yep, I've seen Then that. we have the refinement yeah. of Order 48, which is penalty provisions for uh, non allowable activities like fines for face masks and stuff. Okay, uh, order amending the administration of penalties. So yes. this, these are things that the state has amended, correct? Yes, the okay. things the, government, the governor amended based on the situational evidence and the data changes. Okay. Um, because if you recall, he um, had, he pushed an order out and it, it must have been 48. He pushed the order out for um, finding people who aren't following the guidelines. Okay. Yep. And he treats it like a, he treats it in a specific way. So, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk to Dick and John about this. It just came out, so I wanted to get it in, you know, in front of you guys. Okay. And yep. then the third thing that I have was the DESE DPH joint memo, and it came out today. Okay. Um, I just wanted to have it cry. So you have a few minutes to read it before you go to your school committee yeah, meeting. Yeah, I'll definitely do I'm that. Sure it'll be a, yeah, I'm sure it'll be, it'll come up. Okay. Um, then we had an item unanticipated. Okay. And that was something that Barbara referenced last week, um, but didn't have the language written because the regulation hadn't been finished by the legislature. So this is what they call the electioneering policy. Okay. And the electioneering policy is basically, it, it provides the same allowances for early voting that we have in polling places. Early voting isn't considered, the space where you early vote isn't considered a polling place. So the legislature put into effect protections for those spaces to keep from influencing voters that are coming in to cast their ballot. Yep. It's just taking the normal stuff. Do you want to read through it? Yeah, I'll read it. I am just looking for it now. I'll read it so that people, <clears throat> people see it. So this is a Town of Deerfield Select Board policy regarding engineering, uh, excuse me, electioneering during early and absentee voting, whereas Chapter 54, Section 65 of the General Laws of Massachusetts prohibits electioneering, uh, parentheses, the display or distribution of materials intended to influence the actions of voters, um, close parentheses, at or within 150 feet of the entrance of polling places at an election of federal, state, or local uh, officers, whereas an increasing percentage of Deerfield voters are taking advantage of their right and opportunity to vote in person by absentee ballot or during the early voting period established by the legislature and come to the town offices at 8 Conway Street in order to obtain absentee ballots or cast early ballots, um, whereas such voters uh, should be given the same right and opportunity to cast or obtain ballots free of electioneering activity as, it, as is enjoyed by voters who cast their vote on the day of the election, whereas observance of the 150-foot rule established by Chapter 54, Section 65, at the town offices during in-person absentee voting or early voting period would not unduly restrict the ability of any person to display or distribute campaign messages to prospective voters approaching the town offices and whereas the select board has the care, custody, and control of the town offices at 8 Conway Street and the surrounding sidewalks and may regulate activities thereon. Now, therefore, the select board adopts the following regulation for the period designated for in-person absentee voting and the state's early voting period. No poster, card, handbill, place card, picture, or circular intended to influence the action of the voter 
other than those expressly authorized by general law, chapter 54, section 65, shall be posted, exhibited, circulated, or distributed in the town clerk's office, in the building where the town clerk's office is located, on the walls thereof, on the premises on which the town offices at 8 Conway Street stand within 150 feet of the building entrance door to uh, said town offices, given under our hands this 19th day of August, 2020. So I'll make that motion. Uh, I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Dave Wolf and I. Trevor McDaniel, aye. I'm mute. Uh, Carolyn Ness, I. I'm you. sorry. I had to. I'm slow on muting. Okay. <laughs> We've got a copy here that I'll sign. Dave will sign. And then you can sign, Carolyn, when you come in. Okay. And then, Trevor, I just need to make a comment. I need to correct a comment. When I went back and I reviewed the, um, the Cannabis Control Commission from their information that they sent i'm sorry i made a an error in my comment and that is that um these licenses are given out according to the growth and production of hemp for commercial and research purposes within the guidelines that have been promulgated by the ccc okay sorry i just want to clarify that <laughs> all right sounds good and then I think that's all I had to do, but I wanted to make sure we got through the electioneering because um, Barbara needs that by yep. Saturday. Yep, we're all set there. Um, anything else? Any public comment? Anybody uh, uh, online or anywhere would like to speak? Say anything to the select board? Address I think us? Greg Franceschi would like to talk to you. Oh, okay. He, so if you look in your um, public comment, you'll see that Greg sent the petition. <laughs> Where is he? I know, All Greg I see is flowers. flowers. Are those Greg, flowers are for there? us? He's on mute. He's going to be here in a second. The flowers are for you, Trevor. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> they look beautiful. <laughs> I wanted to, um, to just report back on a couple of things. Obviously, you guys know that there's been a petition that's had circulated. Um, it was based on a letter that Erica, Erica Ross wrote that um, my wife Lisa sent around to people in you know a couple of different venues. I think Facebook probably and um, through you know email contacts. I did the same. So um, so far, 236 people have signed um, have signed the petition, and um, I've asked a few people to call in tonight and. Um, just voice there to use the phone option because mm -hmm. um, I think that there are several people that, especially older people, that don't know how to use Zoom, of including course. me. I have to get my son to help me every time, pretty much still. That's fine. So um, the first thing I would like to do is just um, ask if you could. Um, I tried to explain how to do it to Martha Aronstam, mm -hmm. and um, she asked. Trevor, if you would be willing to to just call her, of course, to have her contact information. I I think and I do. She has, that she she wanted to say as a grandmother and um, you know whatever mm -hmm. senior. Sure. So um, maybe that would be a good place to start. Yep, I can do that. Greg, I guess um, I I tried to call you twice today. Oh, I'm to, sorry. I I tried to call you twice. I I um you know, left a message with you on your cell phone. Okay. And I wanted to give, I wanted to give you an update um, where we're at with what we're doing. Um, uh, there were, testing is a huge element of being ready. And we do have availability of tests. We do have capacity in the county. It is available. However, Everyone and the turnaround is between 24 and 36 hours. However, every once in a while, there's there's a reagent shortage, and we have no ability to monitor it. So this is we're trying to work this out because if you, you, we can't open the schools if we can't do the testing, and it's just it's seemingly random. 
when the testing is shut down and you can't get tests, you know, turned around for like seven to 10 days, which are useless. I also wanted to make sure that you, so we're working on that. We've uh, sent letters to DPH um, from the whole county trying to sort that out and make that, um, make them aware that we have no ability as local boards to help and that testing is critical. The second thing is um, we, um, you know, are trying to communicate, we're trying to come up with a matrix where we have community-wide observation of what's happening and, and real-time um, case reporting. Lisa is our public health nurse for 15 other communities by herself, including Conway. Um, Waitley is trying to hire a public health and truthfully there's been no real communication with Sunderland. So we're trying to work that out. I have an extremely good working relationship with Greenfield and we have set up weekly calls uh, multiple times during the week to touch base. So I feel um, that's adequate. We do not have that relationship with Montague and we have several school choice students coming from Montague. So we're working on that. So I want you to know that we're taking this very seriously and we're doing everything we can to come up with, you know, the conditions that would allow the school to open. However, they're not in place at this moment. How was the, you said testing? I'm not sure what that, who who's gonna, who would be tested. All of the kids? No, if you have a COVID uh, suspicion of a COVID case, um, the, the parent would take the child to um, the community health center, the hospital. You would go to a primary care if they have a primary care doctor. Get an order. Get it done. Um, you know, that kind of thing. But you have to have testing and tracing. We have tracing capacity um, to do that. And that's why, you know, we're very, um, I mean, it's very strict. We've been working on this since, well, for seven months now. So um, we feel fairly comfortable with the setup. It's just, it's not all in place at this point. I also just wanted to kind of hit on a couple of things that the, um you know, the, the rollout is a lot different than it was yesterday, the day before that, the 12th when this was written. Um, you know, we're, we're all taking our time and doing our due diligence to make sure that everything is in place to be safe for the employees and, and the children. And so, you know, to, we can't really, it's, it's hard to just look at one snapshot in time because everything changes constantly. I mean, I think if you hang on at seven o'clock, you'll hear another story that, you know, as it's changed since yesterday and the day before that. So just how we're rolling out, what we're doing, when the kids are coming back, how many, how long they're coming back for. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a constant, you know, negotiation and um, constant slog of trying to make sure that we have everything in place and people are, are secure and safe to go back, you know, to go back, um, you know, based on science. And that's what I base this on all, all the time is the data and, and the science and where we're at at the moment and our capacity. Um, I feel comfortable getting going, but we still have, you know, a few things to lay out and we'll hear from administration tonight. And, um, you know, it's not to say that we won't change on a dime and, and it may be, I mean, from now until the time we go back to school, um, the kids actually show up back at the school. It'll be a different plan then too, um, just because we learn every day and we change um, constantly to, to, to just err on the side of caution and make sure we're doing things right. So, um, we, so as and, Trevor and, said, it constantly changes. This is I mean, a 24 seven situation. We're putting in 50, 60 hours a week, trying to stay on top of it. Every day is different. And the, the um, I know there was concern that DESE guidelines were different than DPHs. We have always said that we were doing DPH guidelines. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the school is aware of that. Um, or, you know, the front, uh, Union 38 has been aware of it and supported that. Um, and we we've just had multiple discussions on the county level. So everyone is trying to be consistent. Um, the problem is it just 
Greg, every day is different. And, and I mean, we're trying to do as best we can. Um, I, I mean, that's all I can say. We have new, new um, data from, from um, DESI, a joint memo again from DESI and the Public Health that came out yesterday. You know, a lot of, a lot of the discussion about, you know, people were concerned. They were like, well, I, I, I choose remote because I want to feel you know, safe and stay home, but I, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid I'm going to get stuck with this second rate teacher. Um, that's really not the case. The same teacher is going to teach every kid. So your frontier, um, you know, whatever the, the classroom teacher, whoever's teaching the class is going to teach both the parents. I mean, both, both the kids that are in remote and the, and the kids that are actually in the school. So there's a lot that's evolving and changing over this time. And I think we, you know, let's just sit back and wait, wait a little bit. We'll see where we're at in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I think, I think we're moving in the right, right place. I can't see you're right. You're muted, Greg. You're muted. You're muted, Greg. There sorry, you go. sorry, sorry. Yep. So you guys probably saw this article mm -hmm. about Athol. Yeah. And the staff is, um, there are, I guess, um, three staff people and one teacher that have tested positive. Yep. And, um, they haven't opened school yet, but when you say testing, will the will the testing also include the teachers and the staff people that work at the school? They will before be everybody before the kids come back. They'll be tested. no, it's not. Well, go, everyone, go ahead, every every person, Greg. Every day, people have to go through a checklist, and 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 you need to stay home, obviously, if you're sick. But if you're, not, if you're you're asymptomatic or whatever the word is, then you would have no way of knowing until you were. No, it. that's right. We we wouldn't know until someone is. That's true. They could already be spreading it by that time. That is absolutely true. Well, I mean, where I'm coming from is I just feel like, you know, I don't know if you guys have, remember the the in the 70s the phrase the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle basically just says that you don't you know you don't. Um, put a nuclear power plant in until you know that it's safe, you know, and um, with this, I feel like I, I felt last week, like, uh, you know, I was just, you know, bringing this up kind of in response to the school committee meeting. I hadn't talked to that many other people. Um, Erica had written this letter and Lisa sent the, um, the letter around, obviously, um, and the software that allows people to um, sign the petition also allows them to comment. So there are a few comments I guess I, I per, should probably read. Um, I can't see anything though, well, but um, I don't know all these people, but Molly Montgomery said, I care about the safety of this community. Maurice Hoag said, this is not the time to test the waters with children. It's being proven all over the country. Martha, I can't make it clear. The last name didn't come through. They need to be remote. Sarah Churchill Windsor, not until it's safe. Luke Strzakowski, we have an obligation to support those that need it most. The safest way to do that is by keeping as many people out of the building as possible. Miranda Kuduki, I'm signing because although our plan has been and still is to work remotely this first semester, I guess you misunderstood that. Um, I feel outline explained to me initially is not to be the case, and I fear this could change again to a fully computerized learning platform. There is a lot at stake. I also need to convey that when administrators say plan for a shutdown at any point, what this really means is plan for kids to get sick with COVID. We don't know how many or how severe, but we're openly admitting anyone's child could become sick at some point. Greg, can I interrupt you, you a second? Because I don't. We've got to yeah. get on to another meeting, so I don't have enough time for for all the comments. But what I want what I want to say is, um, you always manage risk, right? So um, there's always an opportunity for somebody to be sick with many different infectious diseases. Um, the 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 statistics we have right now in our in our neck of the woods is that we are. Um, based on all the guidance, we should be back full time. Um, and and I, I don't feel comfortable back full time, although there's, there's a case to be said that I'd rather have our kids there full time than going out and coming back and going out and coming back. I would, I would probably rather everybody in one school, one building, and 
in that one cohort and not having to go to their grandmothers or you know, a group of kids and then come back to school. Um, that's not going to happen right now with the union we have and, and the issues we have going on right now. We also, on the other hand, are not going to keep our kids home for two or three years. Um, uh, I can guarantee in two years... In, no, Greg, let me finish, Greg, because I'm speaking. Greg, I'm speaking. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that we are never going to be at a better place in t for, for several years, because even if we get a, a vaccine in two or three months, which is a long shot, usually takes 10 years, um, many people are not going to be comfortable taking a vaccine that got rushed out that fast. And a vaccine that gets rushed out that fast may even be at, at, at best 80% uh, a chance of, of making sure, like we, we get our flu vaccine every year. You're lucky if it's 80% good. So you're always going to have this virus in our community. And if we're lucky at, at this safe rate in our community, I'm not saying all over the country and all over the world. And certainly we still have cases that crop up here and there, but we will never be. Uh, I'm not finished, Greg, 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 I'm not finished. You got to wait, Greg, you got to wait a moment. Just let me finish and then I'll let you speak. So we're never going to be 100% safe with this, with this COVID. Uh, it's just going to be here. And the way we have to manage is the risks and health we do mentally to the kids by not having them back and not teaching. There are many children and many families that I've spoken to that are just as passionate on the other side of the issue that you are, and they want and need their kids in front of their teacher for for education and for instruction. So we're trying to find that happy balance of making sure that, our, that we're taking all the safety precautions we can, we're, that we have fast contact tracing, fast testing in case we have an issue, just like we've treated all the cases we've had in Deerfield since the beginning. So I think our idea is to make sure that we have enough testing uh, and enough um, tracing available so that if, if a case does pop up we can make sure it's isolated and we can contact trace it like we've been doing um, and, and then also push out the education and we're, we're doing a better job of figuring out what that education model is and trying to make sure that all kids are being taught the same by the same teacher i'll finish there and i'll let you speak greg okay thank you thank you I appreciate everything that you guys are doing, and I uh, and I hear I hear you completely. I um, I just feel that um, this medium of Zoom, for one thing, is a, is an obstacle to your hearing people in the community. And um, the reason why okay. I, I didn't even know after looking at the website and participating in Zoom meetings with a couple of different groups, and and also in the school committee meeting and the last select board meeting via Zoom that I had the option of calling because when I looked at the page, it said, it didn't even say the word dial or, or, or use your phone to call us. It was in a, a lingo that was specific to Zoom that I was confused by and I didn't understand that I could call in. So I thought I was being so clever tonight, um, telling you know some, of the, some friends of mine that maybe we could just call and you guys could answer the phone and you know talk to people and have, a, have it mic um, because obviously that technology exists and um, the more primitive form of it would be to just hold your microphone, your phone up to the microphone and you know, people could hear each other. But you've already got that worked out through the Zoom, but people in the community didn't know, some people don't know how to use that. And um, Martha Aronstam is one person. So um, there are probably are at least four or five people that I know of that want to call in now. And Martha wanted to ask, she asked if you would be willing to call her because she didn't know what to do with all those numbers and passcodes and all that stuff because she's not familiar with it. So would you be willing to do that? And well, I'm not calling her on the, in a meeting tonight, no, yeah, but I, I will reach out to her. To she I, has to call in. Yeah, I can reach out to her personally and I'll speak to her, but not through a meeting like this. It's, it's not how it works. But I, so, Greg, I've okay. had 250 people were on the school committee meeting the other night and I've probably got a hundred letters um, and then all the people who sign this I know people are concerned it's not that I haven't heard what their concerns are I'm, I'm fully aware 
Um, and I have concerns, just as many on the other side, that want their kids back full time. So I'm just trying to find work with science and public health to make sure we're doing everything we can to find that good, happy medium to get our kids educated and get started back and then make sure that we are as, as nimble as we can if we have a case to address and that we are as nimble as we can be if we do have something show up, we can, we can, we can shut down, assess, and then move on. Um, and either close down and move fully remote or to stay, stay hybrid and come back. So as you see, you'll be on in a half hour and you can watch the, the, the school committee meeting and hear from the administration and local public health and uh, public health nurses to see where we're at. So Greg, can I Greg if, all, if all the criteria have been met and, and we are able to open, it will be a day-to-day -day operation because the situation changes every day. So because we're opening one day doesn't mean that we'll be open the next day. It depends on, you know, if we have cases show up, if, it, if, there is, if we feel there's community spread, or if testing is no longer available um, or return time. Because it, what it is, what it appears to be is the reagent shortage. And there's no way for us to monitor that at the moment. So if you'd have the swab, you put your swab into the reagent and it's been sent out. So like I said, it seems like we have capacity. It seems like the testing is available um, and it's returning in 24 to 36 hours right now. However, randomly, all of a sudden there's um, no reagent and everything shuts down and it's stopped. In that situation, the school can't operate because then testing is no longer available. And that can happen, you know, just between three and four o'clock in the afternoon or, you know, sometime in the morning, whatever. The school then will be closed because testing is no longer available. We have no ability to test. So, I mean, there's so many moving parts. We have worked so many hours trying to build relationships, get the information, and be as safe as possible. Data will inform strategy. But people have to realize this is a day-to-day -day thing. Every day is a snow day call. We don't know what the situation will be from day to day. And when I say we're gonna work on stuff, it's too early to inform whether the schools are gonna open or not. And the reason why is because not everything is in place at this point, but we're still you know, a ways away from school opening. And that's not to say that it can't be worked out or not. I mean, there's every opportunity, maybe we can't work it out to satisfactory level. It's very, very difficult for us as well. We absolutely want people to be safe. I am, that is the number one thing for me. I don't care how many people scream and yell at me. If, you know, I feel it's not safe, it's not safe, and I'm not going to support opening the school. I mean, that's just the way I feel. Um, so, but it's the data, and, and, and we, we don't have everything in place at the moment, but we're working very hard to try to do that, and um, we just don't know when the timeline is. I mean, I'm trying to be really honest and to tell you exactly what we have. There's been a lot of questions from parents. I didn't think that there was any requirement for testing for any teachers or students to go back into the school. No, there we're talking it. about if people are sick or they have symptoms or there's a, a, a contact. If, if, if um, a, say in a split household, um, you know, a student goes home to the father's household on a Tuesday night, and the, you find out that the father potentially has COVID or is a contact with COVID, then you would want to have that child tested. And it's you know, very hard to get tested. I mean, today we, we wanted to get tested. We had to go all the way to Chicopee and we had to wait like 90 minutes and we don't get our results back for five to seven to ten days. So no. Is it, is there no, no, no. That in the county, there is testing, yeah, available. testing available. We, we had a meeting last week with the community health center. It's through your um, primary care. They do it at the hospital. Um, Who is a referral from your doctor, right? So this, this is after somebody gets symptoms or is sick. So Correct. Still no, this is if you're, a, if you're a contact, if you're a contact. 
Right, right. But I mean, none of this gets triggered. People don't get tested until they know they were exposed to somebody with COVID or somebody gets sick. We, we, we do not, we're not just testing our whole community. That is true. Until that, we have you know, the next... The private school, so the, the private next, schools have the financial ability to do uh, testing all week. Every, you know, their student popu uh, day student population is going to get tested twice a week. Their staff are getting tested twice a week. Everyone's getting tested when they come back and, and the, start. The they other, have the ability to do testing in their community on a regular basis. The other, we're hoping mm. that we're going to get some kind of new test, the new test, the spit test, and if that's available in the next few weeks that's that coming on pretty quick because then everybody will be tested yeah it has to be economical and fast so, still there, there's a lot of time lag between testing and and getting your results and it isn't that easy to find a test i couldn't find anywhere where i didn't need a doctor referral and i wanted mm -hmm. to get one right away because i have symptoms and so i had to drive to chicopee today other other than that i would have to wait for my doctor to get around to returning my call and then that felt like it would take too long but the other public health concern, I, I understand children don't do recover from this, and I understand that teachers that are high risk won't have to go into the classroom. I understand there's the option to be remote. But what I wanted to speak about, and, and maybe this, there's another forum that would be more appropriate, is, is the public health issues of the, of the multi-generational households and the grandparents. I have a letter from Judy and John Rose, who were too shy to really talk today, but they're very, very concerned because they take care of their grandson. Mm -hmm. They pick him up from the Waitley Elementary School. They're both high risk. They're both in almost 80 years old. They, they represent a lot of different people. And to well, wait until there's an outbreak and they could potentially be exposed, well, he, there's just... Here's the other thing. There's so many more people affected by the school well, here's, opening than... Here's the, the other thing, Lisa. Lisa, so the other thing is that people have to really look at their own life and decide, um, should, I be taking, should I be picking up those kids? Should I be around them? You'd have to take some personal responsibility and understand, like, if, if I'm at high risk, I should not be picking up my grandchild, you know, or that, grandch or that family needs to decide if that's the only way that there's caregiver taken for this person, because the mom's got to go to work, uh, or dad's got to go to work, then there, there needs to be another, another way to either take care of that or they need to maybe have that child be remote. You know, there's decisions that people have to make personally about their personal, um, their personal exposure and their life circumstances, whether they should be having their kids come to school or they should be having an elderly grandparent picking up a child after they go to a, to a school. I mean, that probably isn't the the best way to move forward for that family, I'm thinking. If they're that concerned about their health and, and where that child's been, um, again, our caseload is very, very low in our community. So I think the, the odds of them, um, of the child contracting, you know, con getting, getting COVID and bringing it back to the family are, are fairly small. And that's what all the data is telling us right now. That's why they're saying it's okay to go back. But, um, but people have to kind of decide for themselves. Is that is that the best thing for our family? Do we, should we take a more insular approach and stay home more? Um, I mean, I've been in the community and I cover all of Western Massachusetts. I go to every single town. I've been working straight on through from day one on this stuff, but I also take a lot of precaution in what I do and where I am and who I'm seeing and always wearing this wherever I go. I've got hand sanitizer in the car. I wash my hands constantly. I'm, you know, I take care to make sure I'm gonna be safe. And um, you know, we didn't see our grandparents or my parents for a very long time because we were concerned. And my in-laws are, are, you know, can be um, susceptible, so we didn't want to see them for a long time. But we've gotten more comfortable. We know how to be safe around each other. I think the students are gonna and the and the teachers are gonna understand what their limitations are, and we're gonna learn as we go. My fear is we cannot stay secluded in our house and not educating our kids for another couple years. It just isn't going to happen. We are the safest we are going to be or have been uh, for, for quite a long time. And if we see, it, see, see the, the indicators creeping up in our area, we're going to have to make that change. But there, I, I see, honestly, there is no way we're going to be at a 0% risk for a couple of years. And I don't think we will ever be. This thing is so ingrained in this, this community uh, this, this nation, um, I, I put most of the blame at the current administration. 
They ignored this problem for so long. They let it go completely out of control to this day. Uh, they haven't set up the infrastructure for the testing that we need. Um, it's criminal. It's criminal what this administration has done. I, just my personal opinion, not a view of the town or the board, my personal opinion, I think it's criminal what they've done to this nation. And um, I hope we see a change. Um, but we have to move forward with what we have. We cannot stay you know, insular for, for many years. I, I don't ever see this getting better. Um, it's going to be a long, long time before we're all safe again. Um, I don't think we well, ever will be. I, I think that at the very least, the Board of Health should hear from the school what their contact tracing plan is, because I've never gotten it. an answer about that. And it seems like they would really have to do some logistical planning. And then they it, have. it would be valuable we're, community also they have. have. We have, have they, Lisa. They have. Yeah, okay. we and have and, and we have. It just seems just so ironic that you guys are so careful about who comes into the town hall and the school committee meets remotely because they feel like it's yes. not safe to meet together yet. They think it's safe for well, it's not of that, kids Lisa. Kids to be together in a building, like it's just you're the irony missing the point. Huge. So it's, maybe it's there could be easier. some communication about why there's a different standard for schools than there are for other. I towns. think I think you're missing the point, Lisa. It's not that we wouldn't meet. I mean, we, David's here. We've meet. We've met many times. We'll have people in the room. We'll meet. It's easier to meet online. So you know, if you don't have to go into a room with you know 20 people and meet. Why would you? I mean, it's so much easier to put it on, on, you know, we've learned a lot from this. People can stay at home and work easier. We can do meetings distantly and remotely. We don't all have to be in the same room, just, you know, and we're, we just voted tonight on a reopening plan for the, for the town, because we're slowly opening that up for people to come in by appointment only as they need and to be open for elections. So I think it's time to start moving forward. We understand where we're at now, and we need to just look at um, how we need to operate as a town and, and take baby steps forward to get to get moving um, and, to, and to understand how we're going to live with this virus for several years to come. And I think um, I, I don't think we can be secluded forever. And I think people still should make a personal decision on their own. Do they feel it's safe enough to bring their kids into a school or to walk into a restaurant or to go to beach, go to the beach? I mean, people are all on vacation. They're you know, going to restaurants or, you know, everybody's kind of going out and doing their thing. When we get to school, everyone's like, oh, no, we don't want to go there. So, I mean, there's, you, I think you can do it safely, smartly, and if you feel like your family, it's not good enough for you, you don't feel safe enough, then you should stay home. I mean, that's, I think people need to p take personal responsibility yeah. about where they're at. I understand that, but, but the other thing is that the school's reopening will increase community spread and i disagree with the logic that it's going to be here for years so we have to just deal with it there's so much unknown about this virus every every week we learn more about how it yeah. spreads how it affects people so and and there and the vaccination could exist in, in you know next year in a couple months in the spring so we will it will be getting better and i think but and what I, are the metrics learn remote. i'm not talking about people not learning so i'm just well, I know, you know, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's hopeless. I know that they, they have to, they want to, they're, they're all hell bent on going in person, but it's just, to me, it's so predictable that within a few weeks, there's going to be cases, increased cases, people are going to get sick, some people might die. May, so may or may not, I don't think so. I'm just trying to advocate for the people who now, who are alive, who won't be, might not be alive again in, in a month. Well, we hear you. Two months or whatever. We hear you, and thank you for advocating. Can I, can I, can I, we're going to move on. Something? Yep, one last That's thing, and we're going to we got to move on. I got to get ready for my next meeting. Okay, so there there will be a bunch of people trying to call in with various information um, and and you know opinions. Um, but I just looked up the results in Italy, and in Italy, back in the beginning of all this, six thousand a day. Now less than five hundred, and the reason is because Italy took it very seriously from the very beginning as have many other countries. Our country yeah. did not do that. Yep. And our leadership has been saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And obviously it's not. We have 170,000 people that have been exposed, right? So- Died. Or that have died. died. Sorry, that have died. Millions who exposed. Who knows how many million that have been exposed. 22 so million. what we're doing, we're gambling with our, our community and our children's lives. And I don't think that it's necessary that we gamble at, at all and I think that the sooner we stop gambling, 
the sooner we'll solve the problem, because the problem will only be solved when everyone is in unison saying that they understand that it's their personal responsibility to do all these things. And when, you know, people are all wearing masks, they have mask ordinances, you can't even walk through the center of Northampton and Amherst anymore without a mask, which I think is a good idea. Yeah. But, you know, we don't want to do it because we're American and we think we can just get away with whatever we want. We can have whatever we want. And I definitely want my kid back in school, but I know I can't have it now. Okay. So I'll keep him out if I have to. That's fine. But then I'm depriving him of access to, you know, what everybody else has got for the short period of time that they will have it. But most likely they're going to have to close the schools. And if we're not testing the staff and teachers, we're going to have the same results that AFOL has which isn't even opened yet. I mean, Apple already has four people, four staff people that are exposing each other, you know, and other people in the building to what they have. And it okay. just doesn't make sense to me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Lisa. Any other comments on the line? We've got to, I've got to get off for our next meeting. So, um, but I do want to allow anybody else who wants to speak or call in, have a uh, comment. And then it's certainly you're welcome to call into the school committee meeting. That'll be starting at, at uh, 7 o'clock. If there are no other public comments, um, I would make a motion to just... Um, bear with me one second here. I'll make that motion to adjourn, Trevor. Well, we're going we're gonna to recess. We're gonna make a, could you make a motion to recess and reconvene at the school committee meeting? I make a motion to um, uh, recess. Uh, recess to um, and then reopen at the school committee meeting. And then we will adjourn and upon adjourn. and we will yeah. we will adjourn upon completion of the school committee meeting. Um, are are you, you are we? How are we connecting to the school committee meeting? So. So uh, before we close out the vote, so what you would do is um, you could sign on, uh, uh, you know, personally on your device. If, if you, again, if you go to the easiest way to sign up on Zoom is to go to the uh, Town of Deerfield Elementary School page. You'll see the meeting agenda okay. there. Once you open up the agenda, it's usually a PDF file. You just click on that link for the Zoom meeting and you will get in. It may be on Google, uh, excuse me, the school vote uh, meets on Google Meet instead of Zoom. So it's a different app, but it's Google. Okay. So if you're using a Google browser okay. or Chrome or something, you'll still be able to get in. So um, I think Victoria, I think Victoria was going to sign in. So. Yeah, that'd be great. And as long as um, you're there, it will be OK. Yeah, I told uh, talk to Darius today. I said that you may be on. I know Meg Birch is going to be there. I've watched Frontiers last night and Waitley's the other night. And um, so I'm, I'm familiar with what Meg is talking about. And so she'll be going through a lot of the stuff that you all have been working with her on and all the other school nurses. So it'd be great if you're there and want to, you know, chime in here and there. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, so we've got that uh, motion to recess and reconvene at the school committee meeting at 7 p.m. And we'll adjourn after the school committee meeting. I'll second that. All those in favor? Dave Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. I call the meeting of the Deerfield School Committee to order at 7 o'clock p.m. on August 19th, 2020. I do want to point out to everyone that this meeting is being streamed live and is being recorded. Uh, so we will commence with the agenda. <clears throat> and the first item on the agenda after the call to order is a review and approved minutes of May 13th and June 18th, 2020. This is Trevor McDaniel. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. Do we have a second? Is that David? Yes. <laughs> Do we have any discussion? I hear no discussion, so all those in favor, roll call vote. Um, David Sharp? Yes. <clears throat> Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. And Ken Cutterback? Yes, it's unanimous. 
make a motion to approve the minutes for Thursday, June 18th, 2020. Do we have a second? Second. Carrie, I Carrie, I thought that was Carrie, so. <laughs> All right, any discussion on this? Hearing no discussion, all those in, well, not all those in favor, <laughs> roll call vote. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. And Ken Cutterback? Yes. It is unanimous also. So that takes care of the minutes at this point in time. And we are up to the financial statement. <laughs> Okay, uh, so first thing we're going to talk about is the warrants that were signed electronically. So we had a batch of warrants in July that were for fiscal year 20. There were eight warrants totaling $49,916.42. And we had two batches of warrants signed for fiscal year 21 already in August. The first contained five warrants for $13,685.32, and the second had three warrants totaling $51,161.33. So thank you, school committee, for reviewing and signing those electronically. Um, Ken, I did send out this report um, to school committee today, so you should be able to pull those numbers right. directly from the report. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I do apologize for not getting it out to you sooner. I worked as quickly as I could this week with all of the meetings that we had. So um, I got it out to you as soon as I could today. In the future, I'll, I'll aim to do I, better and get it too early. I think given the circumstances and the fact that we are able to review the warrants now um, online and before we sign them, it, it makes things much more efficient. So it's... I, yeah, no need for an apology, especially given this special summer that you're having in that in the offices. So, Great. thank you very much for the for the information. I've had a chance just to glance at the uh, financial report. So, um, <clears throat> so thank you again. Any yep. any other news? Well, I, I did want to go over the um, finances that I reported on in that report for this meeting. Sure, um, absolutely. There's a, lot, there's a lot of information to take in. Um, I'll try to talk as clearly and precisely as I can, but move quickly so that we don't hold up the rest of the meeting. Um, but what I'm going to do is first talk about fiscal year 21, how the general fund wrapped up in all of our revolving funds. Then, or, I'm sorry, fiscal year 20. Uh, then I'll go into talking about fiscal year 21, what those revolving funds look like at this point, given the revenue and expenditures, and then we'll close out by talking about the grants that are available to Deerfield Elementary for COVID-related expenditures. So we met about three months ago. Uh, that's the last big financial update that you received. And at that time, we thought we had about 115,000 remaining to be spent in the general fund. Uh, we estimated that we would spend, or I estimated, I should say, that we would spend around $94,000. Uh, and it left very little money remaining in Deerfield's general fund budget, uh, around $20,000, which it was agreed upon that we would in, um, allocate that for the one-to-one -one technology initiative so that we could put that money towards more Chromebook purchases for students. Um, the, any remaining funds, if any beyond that, were to be reallocated from school choice so that we could put money back into school choice in support of the level funded budget for fiscal year 21. Well, I'm happy to report that my estimating was completely off. Um, we actually had more money available than I anticipated. Uh, and we ended up doing a transfer of $195,000 from the general fund back to school choice for use for this year and years in the future. Uh, and that Chromebook purchase was also covered by the town funding for the Municipal, Municipal Cares Act grant. Um, so we ended up with quite a, quite a bit of money going back into school choice. So, you know, I have to thank Tina and the other staff who are responsible for spending at the school level for really taking the budget freeze seriously um, and really keeping expenses down to a minimum in that last six weeks of school. So uh, thank you for that. Any questions before I continue? No. 
Uh, just one question on the uh, Chromebook purchase. Have we heard anything about delivery? Any any no. updates on it? Okay. That's all. No, just a curiosity last, question. Yeah, last I had heard they were on back order and I think um, one of the other principals had heard maybe November they would be here. And I'm sure um, Darius or Tina could talk more about the existing Chromebook state, regardless of that delivery, if, if you guys okay. want that information. All right. So thank you. Okay. So moving on. Um, so the school choice analysis. Uh, there is some bad news here. While we ended out in the general fund positive and were able, able to move money back, school choice revenue was $113,000 less than we anticipated. School choice numbers are based on your end of the prior year numbers. And unfortunately, when the budget was built going into fiscal year 20, the counts were not necessarily um, looked at very closely, the counts of students, and our enrollment in FY20 dropped compared to FY19. So what DESE does is they base your 20 funding based on the prior year, and in June, then they make an adjustment if, you're, if, you, if you've been overpaid or underpaid. And we had been overpaid in the prior year, so they adjusted down our school choice revenue by $113,000. It's very unfortunate, but not much we can do about it at this point. The good news is that expenses were significantly lower because we had um, the reallocation from general fund, but we also had some payroll expenses that were lower than we had budgeted for school choice. So we ended up with a net increase over the projected numbers of roughly $100,000 over what we anticipated. And uh, the school choice revolving fund is right around a million dollars, which is pretty close to where we started last school year at. Um, so we're still in a really healthy shape, which is great news because we are gonna have some hardships to consider for FY21 from um, COVID related tuition and uh, revenue losses. Um, I'm going to move on from there to the early childhood revolving. This was an account that we also discussed in May. We knew that we were going to have tuition reductions because we were not charging tuition during the COVID closure. Uh, so that revenue was down about 27,000. Good news there is our salaries and expenditures were lower than budgeted. We didn't have as many expenses in those last few weeks of school. We didn't have uh, the June summer staffing to pay for out of this count like we do normally. Um, so we still ended in a positive note and currently the end of year balance is about $18,500. The special education revolving fund is the next fund that we're going to talk about. Uh, revenue was exactly as we budgeted it, but expenditures were slightly less. Uh, so this resulted in an increase in revenue of around 15,000 and going into fiscal year 21, the special education revolving account has approximately $82,000 in support of future years. The final fund that we're going to talk about to close out FY20 is the school lunch revolving analysis. Again, another account we discussed in May. This fund had a revenue loss because we were giving free and reduced, or I'm sorry, free lunches to um, not just existing students, but siblings, um, anyone really who wanted it could come, which was great. We could offer that to our community. However, it did mean that we had a decrease in revenue. We did get some reimbursement from the government, but it was um, certainly not where we expected things to be. The net profit and loss for the year was a loss of about $13,000 in the school lunch program. Thankfully, there was a good beginning balance and we're ending the year with almost $26,000 going into fiscal year 21. Any questions about the 20 summaries or any of those revolving funds? One, just one question. Was there um, any way that, um, so the, did the, could the CARES Act help cover some of that funding? I know that the towns paid a little bit for the senior food, but it was just cost, so we probably lost money on that too. And I just can't thank you enough. I really, on behalf of our seniors, I can't thank you enough for what the school did to step up and is still doing, providing lunches and breakfast and stuff for our seniors. Um, it's just been a huge help and such a um, 
even just a social where they can come and get food, um, it means the world to them. And just to get out and be able to get something and have some food and a breakfast for the next morning, it's been tremendously positive, um, wonderful thing that the school has done. I just didn't know if there was a, a way to recoup some of that from CARES Act or any other. So unfortunately, there is not. Um, the good news with the school lunch program is that DESE reimbursed regardless of if the student or family was a free or reduced lunch eligible. So we did see some income from families who wouldn't normally get free or reduced lunch. Yep. Uh, the way that the grants that we've received so far are written, they can't be used to offset lost revenue in any kind of revolving fund. They also cannot be used for any um, expenses that are budgeted already. So yeah. all of these things that happened last year, unfortunately, we can't do that. Okay. The other thing that we try to avoid with, and these are all considered grants, and one thing that we try to avoid with grants is um, there is a requirement with Mass Teachers Association, or I'm, I'm sorry, Mass um, Retirement System to pay 9% of any salary that is paid from a grant into the teacher retirement. So grant funding is limited and we try not to lose that 9% of that salary on top of it from a grant. So we try to do non-salary related expenditures or stipends because stipends are not pensionable. Right. And unfortunately, no, we can't recoup any of that from COVID funding. Okay. Just, just curious. Sure. Okay, thank you. Anything else on 20 before I continue on? No. Okay. Um, so 21, I did send you the general fund uh, July expense report. I didn't send you the school choice numbers yet because I'm still uploading the budget based on what we agreed upon and then some additional expenses that we're going to talk about here. But I, I sent you the July report for general fund. There's nothing concerning. Um, the only account that I'm really keeping an eye on at this point, if you look at that report, Function code, I believe it's 4220 under buildings and maintenance. The line for general repairs is already used at about 40%. So that flagged me that we're, you know, a month in the school um, and we've already used that amount. And what I've learned in conversation with our facilities director is that we pay for the energy management system expenditure out of that line, which is about $7,300. So I think moving forward, that's something that we're going to want to talk about if we want to move that money to a different or that expense to a different line so that the expense that's meant for building, building repairs, the budget that's meant for building repairs actually can repair the building. This is more of a maintenance program. Mm -hmm. They come in and, you know, assess it and fix it if needed, but it's a lot of money to take right off the top July 1 from our repairs line. So just something to think about moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on here to fiscal year 21 school choice. Um, so in the report that I gave you, there was total expenditures of 460,000. That includes 45,000 for COVID related expenditures that were not budgeted when we built the budgets in the spring. Um, the, that money has not been spent yet. I only have it in there as a placeholder at this point in the event that we use all of the grant funding this gives us something guaranteed to fall back on that we're not gonna use for any other need and really hold that money in a safe spot for us. So I wanted you to know that I added those funds in there for COVID expenditures. The other challenge here with school choice for 21 is we took a hit in 20, um, as I explained previously with the enrollment and the tuition, we're gonna take an additional hit in 21. Tina looked very closely at the roster for the end of 20 that the DESE would use to project our 21 revenues. And the kids coming in do not offset the kids going out. So we're looking at a $65,000 loss in school choice for 21 as well. So between the two years, um, we're down quite a bit of money in school choice. It's a uh, I think about $110,000 less between the two years from what we had planned on. Um, and we're looking at ending the year, even with those expenses, right around 900,000 as it stands right now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be completely honest that we're gonna need that money for additional expenses. Mm -hmm. You'll learn more as I continue through, but we have some 
um, tough position we're in with a couple of these revolving funds. Okay. Uh, so as it stands right now, good spot, but more to be discussed. Mm -hmm. Early childhood revolving is one of the accounts of you know, the funds that we need to pay attention to. Shelly, can I ask oh, you David, go ahead. Yes, of course. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. You just said something that confused me a little bit. Um, you, you talked about the outflow of choice money and the inflow based on students coming and going from our district. But we don't account for that in our school choice fund on this paper, do we? Because I thought the outflow... So let, me, let me clarify that. So what I'm referring to is the students who choice in who are leaving Deerfield Elementary, whether they're sixth graders and graduated, or they moved on. I'm not referring to the receive of uh, the sending students out of district. Gotcha. I missed that. Sorry. Okay. No, no problem. That's good point of clarification. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Early childhood uh, revolving fund. So uh, revenues were down from last year, even though we are starting off the year with almost twenty thousand dollars in existing revenue. Um, our projections for this year are significantly lower than what we went into the budget planning process with. We're looking at an enrollment of only 14 students, and not all of those students would be paying tuition um, because our special education students we have to offer free services to. So we're only looking at $14,000 in revenue, um, and that's certainly significantly less than what we would have planned for our preschool programs in Deerfield. Um, expenses do not change, however, even though our tuition source is going down. We still need the same teachers. We have IAs planned. Um, so we're looking at, at the end of 21, the way the budget is built right now, a loss in the early childhood program of $122,000. So this is where I was saying we're going to need that school choice money. Um, it's a you know beyond a bummer that our student count is down and we're we're losing revenue, but we're starting off good and we've still got a good amount in there. Are we seeing that? Um, and, and maybe Tina could answer this too. That are we seeing the low number of students signed up um, based on just the uh, number of kids available or based on COVID? I don't, I don't wanna to speak too much about the number of kids signed up because I can't speak to that. But what I know about this budget is that we have a limited capacity that we can take for preschool kids based because on and ABC stuff. and DESE regulations, yeah. Right, got it, okay. I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with the kids that wanted to come to school. Right, we could take a lot more. If we, There's a lot more people that wanna come, we just don't have the space to be able to do exactly. it. Exactly. New environment, okay. All right. That's so um, we are going to have to make some decisions on where to pay this staffing from. Um, we we could look at the general fund and see what position vacancies we have there because we do have some position vacancies there. Tina may need to fill some of those, but um, we've kind of been holding off on hiring at this point. Uh, so her and I will have to have some discussions about that, or we could always use the school choice funds, which thank goodness we have available to us. Um, long term, this is not just a problem for fiscal year 21. This is a problem for 22 and beyond because if we don't um, replenish this fund in any way, all of these expenditures are going to have to continue to be paid from a different revenue source. And we do not know what enrollment looks like for uh, next school year, which seems far away, but in reality, it's not. And it's things that we need to start thinking about. So, and, and if we don't have it's still limited by the space that doesn't change um no un unless something changes with the guidelines you know if we get a vaccine and, and right. we can increase numbers yeah we we could be in the same predicament next school year if we had a bigger room like if we if just hypothetically we dropped a gigantic inside room there do we would we be able to bring in more people it really has to do with the room and the space right Yes, Trevor, it's Tina. I have to um, keep my camera off because my internet is a little spotty where I am. Yep. It, it also has to do with um, the model too, like half days and um, and the availability of families that are able to join in on our schedule, if you will. 
So yeah. I'm not sure it's very convenient for them. Right. If we were full time, it'd be a lot different. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Any other questions about early childhood before I continue on? No, nope, that was good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so special education revolving fund. Uh, revenue is as we anticipate based on the budget in the spring. There's not a whole lot to report here. Um, we are expending out more than we're bringing in. However, we're starting with 82,000. So we're looking at ending the year, assuming no changes, which we always know that this is one of those kind of uh, uh, funds that fluctuates based on the needs of the community. Um, but we're looking at about $70,000 remaining in the special education fund at the end of FY21. So and nothing terrible to report there. <laughs> quick, quick question though. There was a, a concern with a possible out of district placement. Is that no longer a concern or um, for special education? Yeah, Ken, I don't think that's a, any longer a concern. I think okay. they're housing that Thank too. you. Okay, good. Just wanted to check. Okay, uh, school lunch revolving is the last we're going to discuss for fiscal year 21 at this time. Uh, as I said earlier, we're starting 21 with almost $26,000. Like the early childhood uh, revolving fund, school lunch is going to be problematic for Deerfield Elementary. Uh, we, again, don't know what meals are going to look like. Um, even with students returning to school in the hybrid model, we're not sure how many are actually gonna choose to have school lunch versus bringing their own. Um, DESE could also change the plans. They could extend this waiver where they're offering free lunches to everyone for a longer amount of time. Um, there's a lot up in the air with this, but right now we still have $56,000 in salaries and wages that we need to pay from the school lunch revolving fund plus food costs and overhead for that program. So just looking at wages, we would be at a loss by the end of the year of $25,000. So as we discussed with um, early childhood, we are gonna need to have some other funding sources and make some decisions on where to pay our school lunch staff moving forward. And I'll have more information on that. You know, Mary and I are in close communication about you know, what do we need for staffing? What are we thinking we need for food? And, you know, it, it's been difficult because the plans keep changing and evolving day by day and uh, sometimes hour by hour. And, you know, we're doing the best that we can to come up with numbers. I think probably we're going to be into um, at least mid-October before we have a real idea of what the revenue is going to look like in this account, if not a little bit longer than that. Um, and, you know, I, I, we're going to have to just move some things around based on the, the existing issues we have with the finances for school lunch. Any questions about that? Okay, so I, I mean, I think that we've had to take in some difficult news today. I think um, we anticipated that this was going to be a challenge. Um, certainly not the best position we want to be in in some of these revolving funds that do support our faculty and staff. But at the same time, I'm glad that we do have resources from um, school choice to be able to help support these programs. And again, that long-term discussion is something we're going to have to continue for future years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So the final, oh, Ken, do you have anything on that before I talk about the grant funding? No, I, I'm in complete agreement. I just think we're in, you know, we're in such uncharted waters here that uh, the plan that you've outlined to me and the, the level of detail you've given us is very reassuring. Mm -hmm. um, we know we've got some funds that we can use to cover these, uh, these uncertainties for this year and it looks like for the foreseeable uh, fiscal year following uh, when hopefully things will start to clarify and the, the waters won't be quite as money, muddy um, so that planning for school years will be a little bit easier than it's obviously been during this time frame. So the, the work you, you and your staff are doing is phenomenal. Shelley, we thank you for that. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, quickly I'll close out with the grant information related to COVID-19. So Deerfield Elementary at this time is receiving roughly $162,000 in grant funding. Uh, the first source of, of uh, funding for this was from the Municipal CARES Act that we submitted expenditures for in fiscal year 20. We put in for $65,500 in technology for the one-to-one -one initiative and that has been fully funded. I'm, I'm happy to report, Casey did let me know that we received all of our funding there. There's another small amount of money coming uh, from that first funding source for PPE and sanitation equipment. Then we have a second grant from elementary and secondary education. It's an emergency relief fund. Uh, the, the award for this was based on Title I funding. So Deerfield is receiving $26,651. This has been um, intended to be for COVID related expenses. However, if we are in a situation where we do need to fund something that was previously budgeted, we can use it for things that would normally qualify under Title I. However, we are trying to keep it COVID related because the amount of expenditures is, you know, more than we can even think about every day something new comes up. Uh, and the last grant so far for COVID relief is a coronavirus relief fund, also through DESE. Uh, what they did was award an additional $225 per student based on foundation enrollment, which is our Deerfield students, Deerfield residents. Uh, so that awarded Deerfield Elementary $69,751. So of that 162,000, we've spent around 81 and have about 81 and a half-ish left to spend. Um, so what we will do is spend down all of the grant money. Uh, I will be meeting with Tina in the coming week, if not two weeks, uh, to plan out the rest of that spending to make sure that we're utilizing that money to the greatest potential. And then from there, we have that $45,000 that is earmarked in school choice. Okay. Any grant questions or COVID questions in general <laughs> related to finances? <laughs> yeah, careful what you ask for. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. Okay. Good job. Thank you. No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Shelly. <clears throat> and as I said, thank you. Thank you to your team. Please let them know our. Uh, our appreciation. So um, at this point in time, we we're moving on the agenda to public comment. And uh, just as a as a heads up, if, if there are people and we have about 79 people participating at this point in time and roughly 60, five or six of them would be um, the general public, I think. So if you have a desire to make a public comment at this stage, I ask you to do want to uh, please raise your hand on the chat uh, in the chat area and just say you're interested in in commenting and I will recognize people in order as they come we ask that you only use the chat area to raise your hand we don't want dialogue taking place as, after people or as people are making their comments and uh, that is not the not the purpose when you when you're recognized i will call your name and you will have two minutes to comment um and we will try and stick to about a two two minute timeline and uh go from there so please as i said raise your hand in the um area so i see andrea callahan has raised the hand twice uh, but i figured that was the the intent the first time around so andrea callahan if you know how to unmute, please unmute and we'll take your comment. Track. You're there. Hi. Hi. I'm Andrea Hello. Callahan. Hi. I'm an IA at Deerfield Elementary. I've been there about seven, eight years. I have a master's degree. I make $18 an hour. I, when you look at me, I don't know if you can see me. Um, I am the face of COVID in your employee. Last February, mid-February, a child who had just gotten off a plane who was very, very sick 
sneezed on the side of my face. I ran in the bathroom, I put soap, tried to get it off. Eight days later, I got sick. And on March 9th, I was diagnosed with COVID um, at my doctor's office and my son. By then he had caught it too. For two months, I was really, really, really sick. Um, I should have been hospitalized, but I couldn't because I'm a single mom of a kid with autism and epilepsy. And so the doctors agreed to check in twice a day. They gave me nebulizer, prednisone, rescue inhaler, emergency inhaler, 20 days of prednisone, all sorts of meds. And by the skin of my teeth, I was able to stay home. But I coughed up blood. I vomited. Um, there were days I laid in my vomit because I couldn't get, I was, couldn't change. Today, I went to my physical appointment. And I found out that my doctor told me 70% of the people my age who have COVID end up with structural heart abnormalities. So now I'm getting um, checked for an enlarged heart. I continue to cough all night and a lot of the day, um, and I'm having I have pains in my right my right lung. So they're going to screen. I have a long history of pneumonia. I already had scar tissue, and so now they're going to screen me for lung um, damage as well. You didn't know, school committee Darius. You didn't know about this back in February and March but you know about it now. I don't wanna see my coworkers go through this because there was one night where I was gasping for breath, I was in respiratory distress and I was pretty close. And I don't, I don't wanna see children go through this. I don't wanna be organizing pictures of staff people, my coworkers, my friends, and students, children that I love and care for. I don't want to be organizing photos of them on flags on people's lawns to honor them from COVID-20. So it's it's your it's your turn. Do the right thing. I'm the face of COVID. My life is different now. I hope I get good news. I'll know in five weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andrea. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear of everything that you've had to endure um, during this pandemic. It's as you as you point out, it's it's just un unbelievable what can what can happen. Um, so, Sean Sean Durrett would be next. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Sean Durrett, and I am a parent of a rising fifth grader at Deerfield Elementary, and I have another child who just graduated from sixth grade at DES. Andrea, thank you for being brave enough to share your story with this wider group. Um, I also work as a teacher and a school administrator in Greenfield, and I'm here to speak up in support of the excellent DES educators and staff. I trust the professionalism, the work ethic, and the expertise of all of our DES teachers. And as a parent, I'm deeply concerned about employee morale if our teachers are not validated and respected as the experts in their field. I urge the school committee to do everything they can to listen to and support our teachers, whether the concerns are individual or collective through the union negotiation. Thank you for your time and for your service on the school committee. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I, I, I would also take this opportunity to thank you for the correspondence you have been sending in as well. So, um, Aja, I think I pronounced it right this time. Aja Cerrone. You did. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm Aja Cerrone, and I co chair the CPAC. We wanted to start by thanking the administrators and principals for adjusting the reopening plans to follow both the CPAC's recommendations and the guidance put out by DESE on special education. The slower phased reopening with special education coming in first gives the most vulnerable students a chance to adjust to the new environment this fall. CPAC families are thankful for this consideration. 
We deeply appreciate your change of course to include more students in the high needs category as well, and not just the substantially separate IEP students that was initially presented at the Sunderland meeting last week. Having adaptive PPE available to special education students and staff, along with the options for a temporary shift to substantially separate classrooms, increases the safety for our neediest students. Providing the proposed technology options will improve special education students' ability to access content in both models. The CPAC values the assurances that the district will be able to quickly remedy the backlog of IEP evaluations and annual meetings from last year, complete all of the upcoming annual meetings, and any amendment meetings that are requested this fall, in addition to providing IEP evaluations to students who are suspected of having new disabilities like anxiety or depression resulting from the pandemic. We are hopeful that the information provided in the past four school committee meetings will be compiled into a special education fact sheet and readily available to families as quickly as possible. Because as all CPAC parents know, nothing is guaranteed until we have it in writing. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Asia, and thank you to uh, CPAC and all the concerned families in that organization for your your vocal and uh, you know well-intended feedback to us on our reopening plans. So, um, I believe that is it for our public comment at this point in time. So. With that being said, we will move to new business. The latest update on state guidance for community data metrics for COVID safe schools. And I believe Mr. Modesto. Yes, sir. Um, I'm gonna have um, our nurse leader, Meg Birch, kind of give the overview of our matrix that we've been putting together. For those of you who are on other calls, you've probably seen this before, but um, not this committee. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna present her a brief uh, slideshow. Hi there. So um, these are metrics that um, we have been working on. Um, this presentation incorporates uh, what has been provided to us from the state. Um, and, you know, in, later in the, in the presentation, I'll, I'll address this, but I want to just be clear that decisions um, where we'll, based on these data will be made um, by the Board of Health in consultation with the district um, and where appropriate with other local boards of health as we move uh, as, as, yeah, uh, that's it. So um, I'm starting all of my um, presentations just with this sort of reminder um, because these really are the key um, components for health and safety for all of us in any setting that we're in. Um, it really is masks when you're outside of the home, maintaining physical distancing, um, hand hygiene, and then staying home if you're unwell. Um, so I just, I like to start with those. That's it. <laughs> um, in, in trying to, um, in, in working on our data metrics, um, those of you who have seen other pre discussions and our, on our draft protocols, these, these have changed. Um, there are a lot of data out there and it seemed important to narrow down the data that we were going to rely on um, and also make sure that that data um, were readily available and um, you know easily interpretable um, so we have two source two um, data dashboard points from the Department of Public Health their weekly um, data and um, their daily data, and I'll talk more about what we pull from those um, sources. Uh, the New York Times has an interactive map, it counts that are uh, county le level data, um, and the Harvard Global Health Institute has an interactive dashboard as well um, that has county level data, including counts that um, we can use to calculate some of our metrics. Um, So the, these next two slides are kind of a snapshot of what the state released um, last Tuesday for their color-coded metrics. Um, these, are, uh, these are based on um, average daily cases per 100,000, um, and that's a rolling average over 14 days. These data 
are updated by the state every Wednesday um, and are shown on a, on a map that is available um, in the weekly report and also lower down on that same page. Um, and uh, they've added an interactive piece to that map that you can hover over a town and get more details about um, the statistics for that town. Um, as you can see, you know, the, the, they're looking at anything greater than eight per 100,000. Um, red, four to eight yellow, less than four is green. Their unshaded part of the map is, um, it's a different statistic that they're presenting on the same map, which is fewer than five total cases over the past 14 days. And they see that as relevant, and it is relevant for smaller communities with small populations and very few cases. Um, but, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Next. I set my timer and I'm trying not to go down the rabbit holes that I can easily go down on with this data. Um, so I want to be clear that this slide is showing their recommendations, the guidance from DESE and the, and the command center are that greater than eight cases per 100,000 would um, indicate remote learning. Between four and eight would be uh, hybrid or remote, um, remote if there were extenuating circumstances. And four, they say full in-person or hybrid. Again, um, hybrid would be extenuating circumstances, which they, they don't define, though they do refer to uh, local boards of health, looking at other data, looking at trend data um, to make appropriate decisions. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, no, there's not been any discussion where we've been talking that I'm aware of this district of full remote. So that's... I, I unbolded them in my presentation because they're really not part of our discussion at this time. Um, so when I was when I was looking at the data that we had, when I was looking at the data that were available for the state, it seemed important to sort of rank them. Uh, the primary indicators are going to be ones that uh, would trigger a 14-day closure without question. Those are data um, by the Department of Public Health. It's statewide or regional data based on large uh, numbers um, and fairly stable. Um, the secondary indicators, um, that's gonna be local or regional data. It would, they would, they would likely trigger a short-term closure to allow the Board of Health, um, the district um, to do additional assessment um, and, and seek additional data. Um, Last category is I, I named tertiary indicators. So those are things that would trigger you know, would trigger a level of concern. And so that would be a conversation with the local board of health, whether um, one town, the four towns, you know, likely given our district, uh, and also regional data. Um, and it would again be um, an opportunity to sort of reassess and look at the whole picture um, to determine what's next. So specifically, the primary indicators are, um, we would be looking at that um, DPH uh, metric, um, red, yellow, green. Um, we would be looking at um, the seven day weighted average of positive tests that's available in the daily dashboard. It's supposed to be updated by four each day. Um, it's currently 1.4% for the state. Um, and then we are waiting for DPH uh, and DESE um, <coughs> regional data. And I'm involved in a number of advocacy efforts um, as are many public health nurses and others to, um, to get regional data. So to get county level data, um, to get school district level data so that we could have aggregate data. The one um, about their color coded metric is um, when you're looking at the, the population, you know, counts per 100,000 population, um, they don't report numbers for towns um, below a certain population. And those numbers really are meant for larger um, municipalities. Um, and, um, so so we, we, we often don't get the data that those um, 
and there, and we have small numbers, so it just makes it less stable. Um, there's 70,000 people in Franklin County, so um, calculate something for Deerfield is is not not a, not so appropriate. Secondary indicators. Um, so this is something we can calculate from the data reported um, in the weekly report. The confirmed COVID cases in the previous 14 days, um, looking at less than 25 for the entire county, um, so the 26 towns. And that would include data from settings that are really um, contain discrete congregate settings, such as a skilled nursing facility, um, Franklin County Jail. Um, schools, I would, would not be excluded from that count. Um, generally, certainly public schools, day schools would not be. Um, percent positive, less than 3% for Franklin County. We can calculate that again using the DPH data. Um, 3% is the recommendation, recommended threshold by the Harvard Global Health Institute um, and seems for our at a local level more appropriate um, given our population and our rural connected communities. And then doing a combined Franklin and Hampshire uh, data, um, looking at less than 10 cases per day or 70 cases per week per 100 population, again, excluding congregate uh, settings. Um, and that data, um, that those numbers, threshold numbers are based on the Harvard Global Health Institute um, report. So the tertiary indicators um, that we're, we're recommending or wanting to work with are looking at trends. Um, so, you know, are there, are there increasing trends in our primary or our secondary data? Um, you know, it's important to note that if we see, um, you know, if case numbers across the state are increasing, um, you know, it's, it's going to impact uh, our decision. Um, that trend will impact our decision and, and we wouldn't, I don't imagine wait to hit 5% if the trend is clearly headed that direction. Uh, internal monitoring of data would be uh, looking at illness dismissals within a building. 1.9% um, of the expected census um, and 1.9 is the baseline for influenza-like illnesses for the 2019-2020 uh, flu season for New England. Just, it's a way that um, public health data are, um, it's a measure to, to monitor uh, an uptick in illnesses that are not uh, necessarily diagnosed. So it's, it's a flag for us. Um, and then also a greater than 10% of the um, expected uh, census any given day. And that would be staff and students if they're out, that that would be a flag that would um, would trigger a conversation and an assessment of other data. And then, you know, if we're hearing from the local board of health, um, either for Deerfield or our surrounding towns, our district towns or other Franklin County towns, um, that they're seeing um, increased positive test results in our area, um, that would be information that would, um, would definitely trigger a conversation um, and a reassessment of um, the situation. And then the closure scenarios, these decisions are made by the local Board of Health. Um, I wanna acknowledge that we have um, Board of Health members on this call and I appreciate your taking the time, making the time to be here. Um, so a long-term closure, um, you know, greater than 14 days, um, that, that would be when there's widespread transmission in the community, the indicators remain above the threshold uh, levels with no uh, no sort of flattening of the curve or decrease of trend. A 14-day district or building closure, um, that would be where we're seeing, again, community spread. We have concern um, for uh, that there was an in, uh, instance of in-school transmission. Um, and then it, once the district closed, it would only reopen if the primary indicators were below the threshold and the Board of Health felt that um, the other measures were um, 
they felt comfortable with what else they were seeing in terms of the data and as much as we um, are able to um, you know from conversations with with surrounding towns and um, and districts and then the short-term closures were look would be sort of a one to three or a three to five day uh, closure and that's that's really to sort of basically put the brakes on and do a full assessment of the data see what's happening um, get the information needed to make an appropriate decision about the next step, whether the school would reopen after that short-term closure or remain closed, um, would be determined by the local board of health. Um, they could decide to, ex to extend that closure for 14 days or longer um, if the data indicated that was the appropriate safe decision to make for our communities. It. I almost got it under 10 minutes, Darius. Thanks, Meg. You're muted, sir. Sorry about that. Do we have any questions from committee members concerning the numbers? Um, I, I, I don't have any comments at this point in time, so. <clears throat> I don't, I don't, this is Trevor McDaniel. I, I just really wanted to thank Meg and, and everybody that she's been working with, um, all the local boards of health to try and come up with kind of really succinct plan on how we would look at closures or openings and all the indicators we'd be looking at. And it's a, it's an Im immense amount of work that, um, that Meg and everybody has been doing to try and find you know, the right mix of things to be looking at and following. And I just thank you so much for all that, all that work. Okay. Yes. Yes, Meg. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So, so, um, next we would have planning and scheduling for hybrid and remote models on the agenda. Yeah. So, uh, that brings me back in. Um, so basically you're, you're the, um, I think you're the last school committee to be unveiling of this. And so that we're, when we start going to individual school committees, that's how information unfortunately gets kind of rolled out. Um, right now, uh, basically I met with the, uh, I have trouble spitting this out every time, probably because it's you know not news that I want to be sending out. Um, I met with the administrative team early on Monday and basically we kind of mapped out the timelines in order to get things rolling. And I really need to, to slow down our slow rollout of the hybrid model. Um, basically what, what I'm asking for is to move forward with a two week remote to start. Um, the reasons on that is you know, there, there are several. Um, the first one being uh, there was concerns from the Board of Health starting that, that, that particular week, following um, the Labor Day weekend. <coughs> really, we've seen the uptick after the last major holiday weekend and just open up schools on that particular weekend with all the other anxieties about opening up school um, you know, I was asked if I could push it off a few days. Um, on top of that, we've had, you know, I am negotiating with the union and also working on accommodations for staff members. And that process is taking longer to communicate out to what accommodations can be made, staff members applying for different accommodations and working that into- We both lost for Meg by a long yeah. shot and I am so grateful. <laughs> I took care of her. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. So, um, hey, Kim. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so that being, you kind of brought some humor to it. Thank you. Um, so the, um, and basically, you know, trying to work those things out. We're also getting our buildings ready and in working with different contractors and the timelines on that. Um, there's a lot of different things having to come together perfectly at the right time. Um, you know, me at myself as the leader of this district, I, you know, I put a timeline at the beginning of August that um, I thought we could make. Um, I think I was being ambitious and going to the buffet line, um, you know, with, with big eyes that we could pull this off. There's just a lot of, a lot of factors, a lot of human factors as well, where you can't just, it can't just get it done. You can't roll it out like we do every school year. Um, and so that's, you know, the, my reason for a recommendation of, you know, slowing it down. Um, I was going to have Kim jump on. Just I'm gonna, I was going to present what the slowdown model looks like, um, and um, if you indulge with that, and Kim, will, we'll, we'll go through it rather quickly because I know it's getting 
Now, that was what I just showed. That just shows you how tired I am. Let's not do that. Let's talk about the slowdown model here. All right. Can we see that instead? No. Not yet. <laughs> Guys, I, you know what? I've, you know, I've only done about 12 hours of school committee this week. So this is not, <laughs> if you think I'm joking, I'm not. All right. So here we are. Thank you, Darius. Do you mind just making? Oh, it's perfect. I can see it perfectly. <laughs> there we go. I made it bigger already. There we go. It's just perfect. So yes, Darius uh, talked about slowing this down a little bit by a two week period of time. And this uh, is the draft schedule for this. So if you take a look at August 26, those in that pink color are the 10 days that we're giving to the teachers for professional development. And there's a lot of different trainings going on that day. And um, there's events being made. So those are the first 10 days that brings us to September 9th. Then the official first day of school is on September 10th. And as Darius mentioned, given the holiday on Labor Day, it was recommended to us to do those first days in terms of remote orientations. So those two days in green will both be um, orientations for students and families to become used to the newness of our school. Then here's the week that Darius is really talking about. It's September 14th through the 18th. And those will be full remote days for most students. And we're asking our special program students and our high needs students to start on those days in a half day program. Down the center of the color, you're gonna see this, uh, the center of the calendar, you're going to see a purple blocks. Those Wednesdays will be remote days for all students for a half day model. And in the afternoon, we'll have staff professional development. And as you can tell, and we've been talking a lot about it, there's a lot of professional development that needs to be done. That following week, it's uh, we're adding more of the vulnerable learners. So that's that kind of orangey salmon color there. So we're, we're able to address the needs of the most vulnerable learners. And as you know, the definition for vulnerable learners is, is wider than just students and IEPs. And Tina and her staff are really looking at who's coming in on those days. Then on the 24th, we get to start that schedule that we originally planned for you. So that was that two week time. And those, that's when we start cohort A and cohort B. In the beginning, we would like half the children in cohort A to come in one day, half the children in cohort B, and then the other half on the 28th and 29th. And to do that, we can really get to know the kids, re-meet, um, re re-be together, do the social emotional check-in. We haven't seen these children in a long time and a lot of things have happened and we wanna be able so we can connect personally to do our responsive classrooms and just to really be there for each other. Then on that blue box at October 1st, that's when um, we have that cohort A, cohort B back and forth. And those are colored blue, because as you know, we're trying to go from the half day model to the full day based on um, the gates being open. So the calendar runs that way all the way through with every other day with Wednesdays off. Um, and then obviously we heard a lot about the health indicators and when we can open the gates to, to make, help us make the decisions for that. So that's the main changes in the calendar and the slowdown that includes both a remote start as well as increased opportunities for um, our special population students. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Darius, did you Question, have one? Any questions regarding that? That, you know, so basically our timing, I, I, once, once we kind of release this thing, we've had parents asking, you know, what's this mean? And what's the rollout of this? So basically, may, my role out of this is to be is presenting it to the school committees. We also sent it on to teachers yesterday. It is like we're creating the documentation as fast as we're we're feeding it out. You know what I mean? And just as you probably probably heard, you heard about maybe last night when I got it ready for school committee for the met last night. Um, Frontier is also doing the same thing, but they're doing a different kind of rollout. They have different parameters and that kind of thing. Um, different you know students and that kind of, that sort of thing. So that's the idea. Um, our game plan to communicate with parents is, is going to be. Um, 
you know, we're working it through with teachers right now, kind of, kind of run it by school committee as well. Um, and, and by early next week, getting those calendars out and additional information to parents about um, you know, the following, you know, for this year coming up. So I do, you know, I know parents are anxious to get their schedule set. Um, um, and I, I apologize, we're, we're, we're going as fast as we can, um, you know, to schedule all these things. There's a lot of different moving parts, you know, and um, to get students back in the building and create a hybrid model, which is, you know, I've been, I've been pushing forward. Um, <clears throat> we also have to create a remote model at the same time. So we're creating two teaching models at the same time. And, you know, um, without a whole lot of increase in staffing. So it's working with staff and to create those kind of things. It's complicated. And so, um, and it's a lot of work ahead of us there. So. Yes. Well, I, I know that back when we took our vote, Darius, thank you. Um, continued thanks to you, your administrative team, to the faculty and staff that are working hand in hand with you to uh, develop these various models and, and plans. But I know that back when we took the vote uh, in the joint committee meeting, or I'm sorry, in the individual committee meetings that were a joint committee meeting, uh, that my concerns were that we are voting a plan that provides flexibility and the ability to pivot, the ability to adapt, but also recognize that we had three weeks of what was going to be incredibly intense work for you and your team um, to make plans for the opening. The fact that we're rolling back in concert with uh, input from our LBOH, as well as, you know, faculty, staff, administration, I, I think is a good thing. Uh, certainly with everything that will be going on at the end of August in Western Massachusetts, um, particularly in Deerfield, uh, with three schools coming back into, <clears throat> into session, three independent schools coming back into session and bringing in boarders from all over the country and all over the world. And in addition, bringing students in, day students in from Hampshire, Franklin, and Hamden and other counties uh, on into Vermont and New Hampshire, et cetera. Uh, caution is, is the watchword as, as we move forward, very definitely. Uh, so I continue to thank you for your efforts. Anybody? I would. Trevor? Yeah, I would just like to, um, to, to thank Darius too. I, I do, um, you know, I, I feel as a school committee, we should give uh, Darius and, and the administration and, and faculty as much, you know, flexibility they, that they need um, if they see the need to kind of roll this out a little slower. I know people are anxious to get back to school and they're like, like Darius just said, they're, they're trying, the families are trying to plan what, what are they going to do. Um, but if, if, if it takes a few more days, a couple more weeks to um, make sure that he feels comfortable that he can bring our, our kids back and our faculty back safely. Um, and it gives the teachers more time for professional development and make sure that they feel comfortable um, teaching in this environment and um, they, they feel safe. So I just think it, I'm, I'm totally in support of the calendar laid out here. Um, I think, I know Carolyn had, had um, you know, had also mentioned that, you know, after 4th of July, you could see a slight uptick in, in as people go away on vacation or whatever, the end of the summer, everybody's coming back. I think that's really smart to just give a little bit of uh, more cushion there for, for everybody to, to come back, get settled in and, um, and be ready to go back to school and just give a little bit of more cushion there f for that. That, that seems smart uh, to do. So I, I'm just, I'm in full support of this. Um, it, it makes sense uh, to me, so. Whatever, whatever he needs to get moving, I'm, I'm good with that. I'd just like a little clarification on uh, the what would they, uh, high needs versus vulnerable learners. I see at the bottom it has uh, high needs, mm -hmm. uh, listing a lot of different groups, including early learners, grades PK to five. How is that different from vulnerable learners? Is there a group at the elementary school level that is not considered a vulnerable learner at this point is is sixth grade different is there and i know you're still working at the details but uh if there was any more input on that i'd like to hear it 
The information on the bottom of the calendar, that's what's in DESE guide, guidance and it's copied verbatim. Gives an idea of what they're determining as a vulnerable learner in special populations. And then each building is bringing it back to define it, to think about the kids and to do the programming for all the individuals um, that have found different kinds of difficulties. If it's access, if of the curriculum or other issues can all fall under that category. And it gives the principals and the staff at each school kind of a good wide net to capture those students that we have concerns about and want to support in the best way that we can. And then the last part, Carrie, if you may not know, regarding pre-K, pre-K, you know, public schools are only required to provide public education to pre-K um, for those with special needs or, um, so um, while we have a, a mixture in, in ours, so when you're talking about they are considered a vulnerable group because through the public school model, we are, you know, pre-K is, um, is set that way. So they're looking at them as a vulnerable group. A anyone else have anything to say? Um, I, I have not sorry, can it? Oh, I see. If, so if we're looking at, vulnerable learners going through October, we're thinking there'll be a group at, at DES that will not be starting until after that. Is that correct? There will be a group at DES starting um, in, during that vulnerable learning time period. Is that what you're asking? No, I mean, are there kids who are not considered vulnerable learners who will not be starting until November or later? How no, no, the, uh, the, the no. Yeah. The, when we when we start, yeah, those cohorts that we're talking about bringing back are all students, broken down into smaller groups to okay. roll out those days. Okay. And, and understanding rolling out those days, there's you know we got new patterns, we had new student patterns, and the, the reason why we're doing smaller groups is we got to figure out um, all the different kind of things we're kind of creating a new school in a way in the sense of how we're doing business, and so we got to. If we start working a smaller group, I think teachers are going to be far more comfortable and then troubleshooting those. And that's the other reason why they're half days, because they need the second half day to troubleshoot how we're doing, you know, basic safety procedures and classes with, you know, the six foot spacing and, and, you know, how we're doing from mass breaks to, you know, you know, activity times and those kind of things. A lot more thought has to go in there. So we're creating more time within that. So that's the, I know that there's a frustrating side. I know parents have to be frustrated at the, you know, um, the slower rollout, but that's that's the that's the logic behind it. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, certainly, Darius, you just uh, touched on. Oh, go ahead, David. I see you're unmuted, David. Were you going to speak or? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, you know, it's it's been a it's been a long summer. It's been a frustrating summer for everyone involved. Um, you know, we've seen a degree of divisiveness within the DES community, the Union 38 frontier regional communities. Uh, that is not something that we're used to. And I think, or you know, I'm I'm appreciative of all of the input we've received. My decisions, and you know, I can only speak for myself, but the way I approach the decision making is a balance between the professional opinions provided by our staff, faculty and staff, the professional opinions provided by our administrators and state health leaders and local boards of health. It's a, also a consideration of the needs of the Deerfield community, the needs that are met by our education, educators, by the elementary school, by our school systems in helping this community function. It also looks at the families and the impacts that this horrible pandemic has had on all of us uh, and how, how we can move forward. Uh, so I continue to support the hybrid plan. I'm pleased that the three weeks has led not, you know, has led to a more gradual rollout. It gives us an opportunity to do some remote early on to see what's how that's going. It gives us the ability to, you know, phase in 
reoccupation of the school. Uh, it gives our faculty and staff opportunities to work with small groups of children, and particularly, um, you know, some some of the more challenging population in establishing new safety protocols and, and new standards and practices within the schools. Uh, so I'm encouraged. I know it's got to be frustrating for parents at home, especially single, uh, you know, single fam single head of households, um, two dual working families, uh, you know, child care logistics. I know it's frustrating. We're trying to work through it. I know Darius and his team are trying to make things as workable as possible for everyone involved. And um, I hope that this community can come together now and work to see this through safely for everyone involved. So thank you. That takes a, does that take us through planning and scheduling for hybrid and remote models? We're down now to, I just, go ahead. I guess, I guess one more question just to clear up. Um, when we get out to October 1st and, and on and in, into October, we have, you know, cohort B goes for a full day. Um, say, you know, I'll take the week of the 19th. So cohort A goes for a full day on Monday. Tuesday, cohort B goes. Um, then, then there's the uh, remote day, early, you know, remote day uh, on Wednesday. And then we go A and B again. On the days that cohort A is not being uh, educated, will they be doing remote on the following day? Uh, so the 20th, so cohort A on the 20th, are they working remotely or are they not being doing education? Excellent question, Trevor. So in this phase, students are in the building two days a week and receiving remote education three days a week. So okay. students will always be active and involved in the curriculum that we've built in either in person or yeah. um, through the remote channels. That's what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, what? One other question occurs to me coming out of this. Um, uh, faculty and staff that are high risk, um, you know, and, and I think particularly of that, you know, the the Andrea Callahan's statement and uh, you know recitation of what she's gone through since February and March. Um, is there provision within this that they are working remotely um, in some capacity? are able to work remotely in some capacity to, to fulfill their obligations or what I, I'm just um, from a staffing perspective wondering what what's out there so yeah so yeah so uh, staff members can apply for several different types of leave we uh, Shelly put on a presentation earlier this week to staff members could come on to understand the different types of leaves that are open to them from from the <clears throat> from a um, ADA leave to a um, FFCRA leave to an extended an extended family. Uh, uh, FF, all the acronyms. I'm, it's getting late. Um, but so basically, kind of explain what those things are. We didn't ask people to apply if they didn't think they had the documentation because we wanted to know what we had to work with there and, and what kind of accommodations we can do. Whether the accommodations are remote, um, whether um, there's also child care issues that we're working through. You know, we have a lot of members with with children um, who also. Um, we have children and who may be attending our district or a neighboring district that no longer is open as well. So we have our own, you know, it's kind of in and on itself. You have, you know, we have parents in our own district who can't provide childcare and go to work and are also teachers. And so kind of, you can see how that is a, the multiplication of those issues. And as those issues, that's one of the reasons, again, the overwhelmness that my the administration has done, has had, is those things are coming in. We're trying to figure out how are we going to deliver the education in the, the hybrid model. Um, and we're really looking at you know doing a lot of team kind of you know approaches on that um, you know because we may have some teachers that are teaching remotely um, who, just because you're teaching remotely doesn't mean they're only teaching remote students they could actually be popping into the classroom remotely to give a lesson with support from other adults in the classroom so you know we do have some you know if we have a you know again a master teacher who's a, who can can work those kind of things um, out 
because um, you got to remember that they're you know the student right now the way the schedule set is the student is in is in the building two days a week and out re teaching remotely three days a week so there's a lot of remote teaching that's happening in this model you know the way we have it set up so it's two thirds of their of their education is still remote so remote is really the emphasis and then the getting the people in the in the building in person is the follow up is the connecting of the details is the social emotional um, and, and trying to improve upon that remote learning. So, okay, that kind of answer. Thank you. <laughs> so, any anything else out there? Okay. So, CPAC concerns and questions. New business. Curious, you want me to just? Sorry, if I, I was, I was. There was a, someone making noise. I muted them. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Aaron Bernardino, our director of special education, is going to talk a little bit about some of the CPAC's, um, you know, questions and just kind of general overview of what's happening this this fall. And I want to acknowledge um, Asia coming on as the co-chair of the CPAC earlier. Um, and the fact that this got on the agenda based upon uh, a letter uh, with uh, concerns about uh, the special education plan uh, that was sent to school committee over a week ago. Um, and we started to address that at the Sunderland School Committee. And through all these school committee meetings um, in which we're all in, I think there's just sort of ongoing communication. Um, and so there really has been sort of a change of a change of focus or it continued conversation through various school committee meetings um, because it seems to be the forum we're all in lately um and i just wanted to note what you said ken about um the appreciation of input and i think that's where i'm going to and um how in this time it's so stressful that it's it's easy to go to a place where it's divisive um but really and to just recognize that we're all allies here um, and we're all working together to a common goal and that all the input that's given and all the communication that's given, uh, it's just remarkable at the level of communication that's going on. And so I want to recognize the original letter uh, that was sent to the CPAC a week ago that got this onto uh, today's agenda, but also the ongoing communication by so many parties um, and so many moving parts. Um, so the original, the, the concern that was, was expressed that there was about special education planning uh, with the idea that, you know, the hybrid model was coming out and the remote model was coming out, but what we were doing for special education and what I've said since Sunderland and I know uh, Asia and Holly and others have been now in five school committee uh, listening to this and we've kind of uh, toned um, uh, uh, what we're doing, and that's why her her letter earlier this morning, or her ah, I'm tired. Her letter earlier uh, in this meeting. Uh, so some of the things that I just want to note that we're doing is ongoing uh, communication uh, and understanding that special education is a supplemental service. Uh, so special education students are general education students. So it was very important, as hard as it is to imagine, it was very important for us to have this model. Uh, that we've had for a while now of the hybrid and remote models and working to design those supplemental models, uh, supplemental forms of service. Uh, and then there was the question of how we were defining the high needs students. Um, and that got a little complicated, maybe with some of the things that I said um, at Sunderland in identifying that our schools are so inclusive that many of the school districts around us are identifying uh, students high needs of those that are in substantially separate programming that means out of the general education environment over 60 percent of the time uh, but we are really noting that a lot of our students that would have been in special education specialized programs or out of the general ed population are actually included uh, so we can't just we're not just going to make a blanket statement that our high needs kids are uh, just those kids in substantially separate programs. So uh, administrators, principals, Tina, Elaine, uh, faculty have all been discussing it um, and working with faculty and really looking at who are those high need students. Um, and then we will be reaching out to families. I know um, I'm looking at Tina's picture there. Uh, 
already been reaching out to families to get their input, to find out what changes, if anything's occurred, if there's been heightened anxiety or stress in the families, to find out what's new in those families and to take that into consideration. We will then uh, put together a document after our faculty have time to talk about how and when those services will be provided. We'll be providing parents with a separate document to the IEP of exactly how and when the services and IEPs will be delivered. Um, Again, that wouldn't be a change in the IEP unless through our conversation with parents or from knowledge from the faculty uh, that there's been such a significant change in student need, it warrants a change in the IEP, in which case we would hold IEP meetings. So what this all comes down to is a lot of communication, um, a lot of input from many different parties, uh, continued communication, and uh, it's very exciting um, and stressful and tiring. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to just share as we move forward is we are all allies in this. And mm -hmm. if we understand that we'd be coming from different directions or maybe have our different priorities or different input that we wanna give uh, moving forward, if we just all assume good intent uh, and mm -hmm. share our input and our communication in ways, um, we can continue to just build uh, a district in which we have an expansive and strong continuum of services for all students. Um, so I thank uh, the CPAC for their ongoing communication to faculty, administrators, school committee for your work. Uh, and if you have any specific questions about special education um, and what we're doing, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> any questions from the committee? I guess not. Um, are we moving to executive session, Darius, this evening? If you'd like an update on negotiations, you are. I think I can see most everybody in terms of committee members. Are we interested in an update? Mr. Sharp and Carrie and Mary and Trevor? <clears throat> sure. Yes. Yeah, I would be. Okay. Again. Yes. Okay. Um, so for the general community, we are going to be entering executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 uh, to discuss strategy with, with respect to collective bargaining, teachers and instructional assistants. Um, this will be a separate closed meeting when we reconvene, we will be reconvening to take no actions, only to adjourn our general meeting. Um, I want to thank all the public and attendees this evening for listening in and hearing all that's going on with our school community. Um, I, I'm gonna take one, one more moment to uh, to get on a podium, I guess, and, and just say a couple of things about community or continue to say things about community. Uh, as we've gone through this process, it's, we've had you know, powerful emotional stories and um, happenings described by people such as Andrea Callahan this evening and earlier people. Um, I, I can only say from, you know, from my perspective, our community, our school community really, you know, reaches out to provide support wherever we can. We're sorry to hear of these things. I, I you know, I have family who have had COVID-19. I have a daughter who is a teacher who's wrestling with all of the issues that our faculty and staff are is wrestling with. Um, I, I fully get it. Um, and I just, I, you know, as Karen said, I, I hope that our community can now start to build, build back and remove some of the divisiveness and, and continue to work together at, on this issue. And uh, we hope that the world and the nation as well move forward and we get to get our arms around this thing as quickly as possible. So sorry to get back on a podium for a while, but um, I will now entertain a motion unless yeah, someone else has comments. Absolutely. Could I interrupt 
you for a second? Um, is this Greg Franceschi? Franceschi. Yes. Franceschi, sorry. I am. Um, I am. Um, I thank all of you for what you're going through. I can't imagine how stressful it must be. I think that um, everybody in the community is really stressed out and anxious about this. And um, I just want to say something. And I also want to thank you for you know, really reminding everybody to go and listen to each other. Part. We all have our opinions, and I think that um, mine are very emotional. I have a son who's in school, and um, I'm worried. You know, I don't want him not to be in school. I don't want him to have a different education than all the other kids, or all the other kids in his class. But if you would consider, you know, just for a moment, a little exercise with me in. The part of yourselves that realizes the absurdity of, of this situation. In the world, there are 7.8 billion people. There are 783,000 people that have died. 175,000 people have died now in the United States. Our population is 382 million. So, 7.8 billion people, 783,000. 300 million, 382 million. Uh, we're, we're doing something wrong. And I feel like we're following leadership that doesn't make sense and ignoring our basic emotional, intuitive understanding of the reality that none of us want to see any of our friends, teachers, children, co workers, anyone hurt. That doesn't have to be. And, uh, Control who, who dies from this yeah. without having contact, without having everyone entering the building tested before they go into the building. We don't know who's bringing what into the building, so we're basically putting everyone into a petri dish instead of keeping them safe in their homes and letting them survive the emotional trauma that it will cause them to be at home with their families or with support people. You know, compared to the emotional trauma of losing a parent or losing your, you know, a family member or friend. And I just feel like, you know, we're all on the same page in that concern, but we're forgetting that whoever is coming up with all the statistics about, you know, 5% and this and that, it's people. It's not, it's not percentage points. We're all, you know, on the same page with that, I think. So I want, I hope that you'll reconsider and give the teachers a chance to prepare to teach the kids remotely. They're gonna need a lot of time and, and training in the next few weeks to be able to pull it off. Otherwise it's gonna be a big mess, just like it was in the spring. And you're gonna lose kids because they're not gonna be able to hold their attention because it's a very challenging thing to suddenly go from teaching a class full of kids that can ask you questions and interact with you and get encouraged in a very personal, way to doing it through a computer but there's there've got to be you know there are obviously people who are doing going to do it remotely there are experts in our community who teach remotely already that we could learn from and i just feel like we should be putting our 100 percent effort into trying to do a really good job of remote learning and then you know in november or december once things have hopefully improved in the in the country as a whole and you know, stayed stable in our area, we, you know, go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you, Greg. So, You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> um, executive, uh, with that said, uh, I will entertain the motion to enter executive session pursuant to M Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, <clears throat> teachers and instructional assistants. I'll make a motion or so moved. David. I'll second, Trevor. And we'll go to a roll call vote. And um, David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. 
And Kenneth Cutterback, yes. At 8.31 p.m., we are entering executive session. As indicated, this <clears throat> public meeting will reconvene only to adjourn when we're done with our executive session. So thank you all for attending.